when did you start thinking about racism as a religion? When I made the nine areas of activity. When I listed those, and, and the seventh area was religion, and then naturally I had to get into defining what religion is. Strong belief backed up by action, and just by that process, stumbled into it. Because then I had to ask myself, okay, well, what is the strongest religion? What's the most prominent religion on the planet? If you go by that definition, strong belief backed up by action that may or may not have a God at at its head, in which case the religion of the white supremacists is white supremacy and the God of that religion of the white supremacists themselves, according to the evidence. So that's how I came into it. It just evolved just by me seeking to follow the the logic. Compensatory logic, I mean, you know, just, you know, that's that's how you, you raise the question. See, it starts with a question. Everything starts with a question. What is a religion? Okay, there are many, many religions throughout the planet. Now, of all the religions, what is the strongest one? And that's what I came up with. So I decided to put it in capital letters, the religion of white supremacy. And there's a statement, you know, with several elements, I think, and the question is raised, how did that evolve in my mind? And uh, also there was a, a white man, I think he's from Alabama, back in the 1960s, and he said, people ought just ought to stop, you know, having you know, all these arguments and falling out about this thing about race. He said, it ain't nothing really complicated about it. People are just stop getting all emotional about it and just be uh, sensible. And then he followed that up with a statement that, that kind of, I think it kind of influenced me going in the direction of that religion thing. He said, it works like this. Say, God made the white man to serve God. And then he made the nigger to serve the white man. Now, if everybody just leave that alone, everything will work out fine. That's God's will. God made the white man to serve God. And then he made the nigger to serve the white man. Now, what's the problem? And so I thought about that. And then I said, yeah, but there's a flaw there. Because if God made the white man to serve God, and then made niggers, meaning me, to serve the white man, why do white people in general have to be so deceptive in what they do? Why do they have to do things that are not necessary to do? See, and so a question is raised and, and harmful things. Why do they have to do all of that if they're serving God? I mean, what kind of God would set up something like that? See, it's not logical when at the same time they say God is good. Well, why would God assign people to act the way that white people act? See what I mean? And then have them boss black people. And have, you know, black people doing some of the things that are very, very, that they themselves, the white people say, are very ungodly. According to them. Whomever God is. So it didn't make sense. So it sounded like, hey, that's just a statement to cover what people want to do anyway on their own and saying that God set it up. You know. <laughs> now, it could be, but it does bring things into doubt. And so I, I chose to go the doubt route based on the racists will lie. If you got an assignment by God, you don't have to lie about nothing. Just tell people straight up, hey, I'm just carrying out God's will, you know. I ain't going to lie to you about nothing. But the white supremacists lie. They say things that are not true all the time. Very deceptive. So that gave me reason to believe. No, no. They have invented a religion 
and they don't call it that in general conversation, but that's what it is. The Cow's Gusty Renegade Context of White Supremacy in for another broadcast way early for us, our normal broadcast time, 8 p.m. Eastern, so we are super early, and I'm on the West Coast, so it's 11 a.m. here. My goodness, not a morning person, but hopefully we'll be constructive at our early hour. For people who have been listening to the cows, if you listen chronologically, I've said that for a long time, for the whole 13 years that we've been on the air, if you listen chronologically, it will make a lot more sense. You'll learn a lot more. Just, wow, the programs that we have had just within the last 30 days, really just within the last five days, but really, last 30 days, what we've done this year, amazing. All of the connections, I'll try to point out some of those As we proceed, I'll start with, so how did we end up with this early broadcast today in our book club, Thursday, installment number four, Essie Mae Washington Williams, Dear Senator, where she's talking uh, about her father, the late former governor, former senator, U.S. Senator, J. Strom Thurmond. Uh, admitted flagrant white supremacist racist talking about him being her father, Essie Mae Washington Williams. She starts that book not with information about her white father, but about the lynching of Zachariah Walker. I had never heard of Zachariah Walker or this lynching that happened in Pennsylvania, no less, not down south, near Philadelphia, brotherly love. I go to the University of Washington Library, recently back opened after the COVID shutdown and everything, go back to the library for the first time in two years en route to get the book on Zachariah Walker whole different book about his lynching we'll be talking about that later this month hopefully I stumble and like whoa they have an entire lynching section at the University of Washington library and it's all about the lynching of black people I've been to this library hundreds of times I've never seen the lynching section it's not called that but I mean all of the books and I mean it's tons of books I could sit I couldn't even take one picture I had to take multiple pics because there were so many books on black people being lynched so I took my pics grabbed the book on Zachariah Walker after I exited the library I looked at the pics that I took and said oh man I didn't even really take the time to look at some of these titles and you know explore like I maybe should have checked out five or ten of these so I'm looking through titles and and I catch that wait a minute at the altar of lynching what why didn't I grab the no it was quite a few where I said that after I looked like dang why didn't I grab that why didn't I I didn't come for all that I guess so I said I have to have to go back so I go back wow now again if you've been paying attention so just last week (laughs) The whole reason that we're reading S.E. May Washington's memoir is because we had J. Russell Hawkins as a guest on the program. What was his book? The Bible told them so. How white <laughs> Southern evangelicals fought to preserve white supremacy. So that was literally days ago. And in between all the S.E. May Washington lynching John Lerman and now at the altar of lynching that's how we ended up here now that's just some oh my once you get into the details of this like wow (sighs) so our author we're at the altar of lynching a pleasure to have him on the broadcast and in fact had to make sure it was so delicate he had we had to not only be early to accommodate, we, we also had to make sure we didn't conflict with UNC basketball or Duke Blue Devil <laughs> basketball. I had no idea they would be playing each other in the Final Four. So, wowzers. So crazy all the way around, but we're glad. I guess that both teams made it to the Final Four, and he was going to be happy regardless. So, he'll be rooting for new UNC uh, tomorrow night for the championship game. Go Tar Heels. Uh, so thankful that he could hang out with us this Sunday afternoon for him, Sunday morning for me. 
We'll chat it up about Mr. Sam Hose, also known as Tom Wilkes, uh, joining us live from North. Yes, I believe it is. And joining us live from the great state of North Carolina, our guest, Dr. Donald G. Matthews. Dr. Matthews, are you with us, sir? I am with you. Yes. Go Carolina. <laughs> right on. Go Tar Heels. Uh, we will chat about uh, the book cover as much as we can for the broadcast uh, for our listeners. I'm sure there's some folks. This is their first time uh, hearing about Sam Hose and at the altar of lynching. So anything that you would like to tell them about who you are, the work that you've done uh, before we get started? Um, I've uh, written about religion in the South. My first book was uh, Slavery and Methodism. And I wrote about gender in the South, uh, about uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, I got into lynching when I was trying to write a uh, sequel uh, to my second book, Religion in the Old South. Um, And then I ran into the lynching of Sam Hose and the defense of that lynching by a woman by the name of Kyra Harris, and who was a Methodist minister's wife, and um, that got me interested, and that's how I started. And that was 18, 1980, 1998. It took me a long time, finally, to finish it. It took me 20 years, but uh, I've been living with Tom Wilkes for a long time. My grandfather uh, was brutalized by a white mob for defending... Uh, of protecting a black family in Oklahoma in 1910. Uh, and so that also uh, helped me uh, wonder about lynching. Mm. That's at the very beginning of the book. We will uh, read an excerpt of that and get some details. Uh, is it acceptable? Feel free to uh, decline. Is it acceptable, acceptable for me to ask how old you are, sir? <laughs> Ninety. Right I'm on. 90 years of age. Right on. I thought that would be important for our listeners to have that as we're chatting it up. That I think that would put you in what they call the greatest generation, yes? <laughs> well, not quite as much, no. Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was 12 years old when uh, President Roosevelt died. Okay. Close. Close. A little, Close. I guess, a little young. A little young. I remember Pearl Harbor, yes. I do remember that. My father was listening to it on the radio. Wow, okay, okay. Uh, And you are a white man? Yes, white. Very white. Right on, right on. Uh, This broadcast context of white supremacy, I use the term racism and the term white supremacy as synonyms. I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, The definition I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you think such a system exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? Uh, I understand that uh, Chinese are having some trouble with Africans uh, when they are in Africa. So I'm not sure it's uh, really just, just whites. But I think white supremacy, uh, the supremacy of, of one race, so-called race, there's only one white race, and that's the human race. I think you're, you're quite right about the necessity to be supreme. Uh, there is a negative attitude, negative sense of uh, anyone or anything that is not, quote, high, white. Yeah, you're right. Hmm. Okay. Uh, just making sure I'm clear for listeners uh, in terms of a negative attitude or what have you. When I say yeah. racism, white supremacy, it is about yeah. domination, mistreatment. Yes, domination, in, indeed, yes. Of folks who are classified as white. Probably domination, as not white. Yeah. 
of folks who are classified as not white, uh, so-called Chinese, so-called Africans. These are individuals who are not white. These folks would be subject to victims of white supremacy racism, unless I'm mistaken. Am I following logic here, Dr. Matthews? I think that's all right. I, I, I'm not going to quibble about it. No, I'm not going to quibble about that. That sounds reasonable to me. Okay. Trying to be logical, uh, accurate, uh, early in Sunday morning. My goodness. Hard, it's hard to be accurate on racism because it is so general. The accuracy, you know, it's very... Pe- people don't know how they are themselves racist. They don't want to admit it because they think it's an attitude. They don't think it's an assumption about their right to uh, rule. You're you're right. It's about supremacy. And uh, that that the people that are like me are the only people who really matter. Yeah, you're right. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I guess before we get to uh, at the altar of lynching, Tom Wilkes, uh, also known as Sam Hose, uh, one... Uh, there's a non-white author. He's written, uh, he's written many pieces, but he writes about racism and he wrote a yeah. piece in 2014. He said that many white people are often greatly and sincerely pained by racism, but rarely are they pained enough. And I've been asking our white guests over the years, and particularly in the context of this book, because wow, does that come up here, talking about the lynching of Sam Hose. But in your experience, you've been on the planet decades now. Uh, <laughs> do you think that a substantial number of individuals who are classified as white, do you think that they are often greatly and sincerely pained by racism? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there are many people who are not pained pain, pain by their racism. And in, in fact, they uh, glory in it. Uh, but, you know, I, I, it's hard to get inside. There's the difference between attitude and structure. And uh, the way things are structured uh, often uh, are, are supremacist uh, without any kind of attitude being uh, uh, guiding them. And uh, so we have to understand, I mean, uh, we have to understand that um, this way we are, we have formulated our economy, the way we formulated our politics, uh, all of these things, people who think that they are not supremacists or within a structure that is supremacist, and uh, that's a, that those are two different things. As uh, the people who uh, talk about uh, race theory say, hmm. I'm not sure I got an answer to my question, and that's one I try to inform <laughs> non-white listener. Oh, we got the laugh too. For non-white listeners to really be cautious, I found over the years I've concluded frequently, yeah, individuals sure. classified as white. One of the ways that they practice white supremacy is through deception, and that will be not answering questions when they're talking about yeah. racism, especially if they're talking to a non-white person. So I'm going to go again. The question was, Dr. Matthews, yeah. white people that you study, that you're around, your family, friends, other North Carolinians, do you think that a substantial number of white people are greatly and sincerely pained by racism. I don't know if you mean by pain. They are not pained by it. They are afflicted by it. They share it. I don't think they give a damn about it. Uh, They are pleased with it. They are pleased with their racism. They're not pained by it. Uh, If I'm pained about something, it hurts. I don't think many white people are hurting because of their racism. Mm, there we go. Got a explicit answer. Much obliged, Dr. Matthews. We I've asked a number of white people and we've had quite a few white people who eventually have said yes. They 
said something similar to what you said, that they do not see evidence that white people are pained by it. They enjoy it. Don't care about it. Whatever. Living their life. Right. Sam Ho should have died. That'll come up in the book. We'll get to revisit that one. Um, before I get to this here book and your grandfather, because you start with all of that, I thought that whew, revealed quite a bit about racism as well. We yeah. do have a UNC alumnus and a Duke alumnus, which I told them in the email. That's crazy. Like, I never hear anybody who reads for both schools. Uh, we are also really like, what have we done in the last 30 days? We also talked about the Duke lacrosse case. One of yeah. the most important quotes in the book, because we had William Cohen on the book. We talked about his book, The Price of Silence, the Duke lacrosse scandal. He's a Duke alumnus, by the way, white man. Uh, but we talked about yeah. his book and one of the quotes of the book. Oh, my. I could just read it and get your thoughts. You could tell me how it relates to what we're talking about today. Uh, for folks who don't know, I guess the Duke lacrosse scandal from 2006, uh, the lacrosse team, mostly white. In fact, all white players except for one oh, black yeah. guy. And uh, they are accused of sexually assaulting a black female uh, dancer, stripper, so-called uh, Crystal Mangum is her name, black female. Uh, this played out for a long time. Uh, they were intru- eventually declared innocent, which is put an asterisk there, but long tardry scandal accused of racism in, in the midst of it and all. Uh, anywho, so this is 2006. The Price of Silence. Mr. Cohen, he writes, <clears throat> he's talking about some of the emails that were sent to the Duke staff members, especially black staff who were speaking up for mm-hmm. Crystal Mangum and all this. So he writes, among the email messages that Carla Holloway, black professor, received were ones that contained the phrases, you stupid, bitter, black bitch. What a fool you made of yourself jumping on the guilty bandwagon only as a pathetic attempt to appease your own anger for growing up ugly. And <laughs> the fate of black people. Oh, you, whoa, 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 you haven't even heard. The fate of black people is sealed because whites possess superior logic. We need to show more rape cases on television between black men and black women to further educate black women direct quote from the email that or one of many apparently that were sent to black professors during the Duke lacrosse scandal circa 2006. What do you think of this email and what were your thoughts when all this was unfolding as a white man who studies racism and a Duke alumnus? Well, it was a, it was a very difficult situation for all. James Coleman, a black professor of law, uh, probably has the the best uh, take on it as anybody, but I haven't. I've read uh, his, his columns at the time, but I haven't. I haven't read anything since on it. And quite frankly, I haven't really thought much about that since then. Um, the uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm somewhat uh, flummoxed on this because I I really. <laughs> It's been a long time since that's happened, and I'm not don't really don't really remember anything. I'm not surprised that people would write like that. I mean, they're, they're, they would write like that today if something like that occurred. Uh, I would expect them to anyway, and I would expect black uh, black professors to get us uh, the same kind of uh, of comments on the email. Uh, I have no doubt of that. Uh, uh, but but as to the uh, thing with uh, Miss uh, Miss Mangum, uh, I, I'm really right now I can't comment on that because I really don't know that much about it anymore. I was following it at the time, and I, everyone was very upset about it. And one of my friends, uh, at Duke, uh, very much upset. The history met people in the history department uh, understood very well what was going on. Uh, um, but that, I, mean, I have to admit that, that right now my my memory of it is not all that great. Right on, right on. 2006, not exactly yesterday. Um, <laughs> That's right. That quote, though, wow. 
I try to remember that yep. one. I don't, read it as I don't remember. I mean, that's not a. I'm not surprised at it. I, I'm not. I mean, that's kind of par for the course. I would think. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you can, it would be par for the course for pretty much any time under the system of white supremacy over a period of centuries, really. Uh, and get right to at the altar of lynching. Uh, and in fact, whew, there's so many great one liners here. Religion did not cause lynching. Lynching was religion with was in italics. Whew. The, Any. Yes, the the action the action that takes place is a liturgy of white supremacy, um, and the people are involved in the lynching are seized by what they were doing as something as you know transcendent uh, to everyday life, and they are so touched by it. Uh, it's so much like the r- religious revivals that some of them had participated in as children and as juveniles and as young adults uh, that it's not surprising that an old man should have shouted as uh, uh, d- d- Tom Wilkes is dying, uh, glory, uh, glory be to God. That's not surprising at all. It's part of the uh, things that seize people when they are acting in behalf of their own uh, supremacy, I think. Mm. Uh, I want to get you to, uh, I want to read a, a short excerpt from the book. This is uh, from the very beginning, the introduction, Lynching and Alters Family Memory. I'll read a little bit for our listeners and then get you to uh, give us some detail. So you write... <clears throat> It was not the theological explanation of atonement that affected my imagination so much as the frenzy and narcissistic delusions of the mob that cries, crucify him. I never historicized the mob as Jewish. It was rather a taunting, fevered and self-righteous rabble. That is humanity. It signified my grandfather's assailants. The rabble could eat very easily be Christian, as my pastor once pointed out, because in later Western history it had been Christian. Medieval pogrom, pogroms against Jews erupted from within Christian communities that became furtive democracies of punitive hatred. Though history, through history, scripture, and family memory, I imagine the crowd before Pilate as transforming their deference to tradition and self-satisfaction into a demand for blood. This sacrificial drama at the center of the Christian imagination suggested the nature of every killing inflicted by a group acting under the delusion of its purity and righteousness. Crucify him as a cry of rage prefigured the accusation, damn nigger lover. That reference explained my grandfather's fate but was surpassed in significance when burn nigger burn became the cry in horrendous lynchings such as that of Sam Hose. For a long time I suppressed the mystery of that awful night in Oklahoma but eventually I came to wonder where my grandfather's defenders had been. In the fog of naivete best suited to a third grade Sunday school class I asked Where were the Christians? How could a community in which the sacredness of human life was supposedly valued according to a gospel presumably preached to offer redemption allow a mob to punish a man who protected those for whom their Christ had supposedly died? The formulaic narrative of sacrifice is honored even in the most elementary of Christian imaginations. But I had conceded too much rectitude to the designation of Christian. I had forgotten the pogroms and the hymn-singing Christians who legalized African slavery. I had forgotten that Christians bought Africans from slavers and created American capitalism. I had forgotten that if some Christians had fought to abolish slavery, others had prayed to transcend it 
and still others had defended it by ignoring Paul's appeal to Philemon that he accept Onesimus once a slave as a brother in Christ. I will stop there. This is all at the beginning where you talk about your grandfather being brutally beaten by a racist mob for not handing over black people beaten and they thought left for dead. Why did you start off at the altar of lynching with this? I want to explain. I, an introduction. I thought of the introduction as explaining to people who would read the book where I was coming from and understand that I had this attitude, this sense uh, that I was in no way uh, able to understand the lynchers as somebody I could identify with. Uh, and that's why it's part of an introduction. Um, and I must say, I, I mean, it's been a while since I since I wrote that, um, but uh, I, uh, I was ordained a, a Methodist minister, and I took uh, homiletics in seminary, and uh, uh, it, when you read that, it sounded like one of the most biting sermons I could ever have preached. I was pissed. Hmm. Well, uh, I was going to say it's almost... I have to say, I have to say that I came to the South in order to understand, uh, I thought, uh, slavery. And I came to the South, too, to try to understand the South, because my father thought of himself as a Southerner, and it didn't make any sense, uh, since the people... Uh, who uh, brutalized his father had um, had come from were called uh, in the in the Indian Territory Little Dixie, and so I you know I don't I, that's what I came south to understand the South and what happened when, and my my fa- grandfather's grandfather was an abolitionist, but I didn't come south because he, of that I came south just to understand the South. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, I, I read about this lynching in 1998 that, that I began to realize why I had begun to study Southern history and Southern religious history. And the reason was that my grandfather had been brutalized by a mob. And I had to face that, and I had to explain that to people. Uh, there, there, there is a there, my my grandfather was probably what people would still call a racist in that he referred to blacks as niggers. Um, uh, when 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 I first heard uh, about his situation, um, he mentioned the thing that that started my family. Uh, uh, kind of dis- disorientation that Sunday afternoon when my uh, my grandfather said that he had he said I had a friend once and he was a nigger and my grandmother went into hysterics and I didn't understand that and it went into hysterics because of what had happened to her husband after that and then I began to think about when I read the defense of lynching by this woman, Cora Harris, and the fact that she was a minister's wife, um, everything seemed to come together in that one moment. And then I decided I'd have to start to start start thinking about lynching a religion. And then eventually, as I said in a lecture to Duke University uh, faculty, I thought began to think of lynching as religion because it was religion and my friend and colleague there uh, John Hope Franklin told me you've got to tell that story Don you can't let it go and I said uh, John Hope I, I don't I don't know how, how to do that and he said yeah, you'll figure it out and that's what I did mm. Mm, mm, mm. you uh, just add a little bit more on uh your grandfather, those who validated community violence, 
insisted by the end of the 1890s that lynching was not a breach of law, but merely its quickening. Lynchers were the same people who made up juries, it was said, and if in this case John Matthews had not broken any law, he had nonetheless thwarted the will of the people. That he yeah. had identified himself briefly with black people meant that he had challenged the whiteness of authority and had himself become in effect nigger this primal violation of the ruling ideology transformed him into the personification of everything that threatened democracy John's he son. went against these people he went against his neighbors yes white supremacy racism I always like to pull these type of examples out because I tell people hey if you are a white person you cannot be ignorant about racism white supremacy other white people will immediately generally speaking let you know hey what are you doing you are a white woman you are a white man you should know better what are you doing harboring niggers what are you <laughs> Might as well be a nigger yourself. You want to harbor niggers will treat you like, cause it's lots of, well, I won't say lots, but it's enough of those stories throughout the generations. You cannot be white and be ignorant about racism. Is that logical, Dr. Matthews? No, you shouldn't be. Um, I was thinking, you know, there is, <clears throat> there are thousands of people like John Matthews. Uh, they're just not in the minor majority, and uh, they're not, and most are not going to take the action that he did to dem to actually impoverish himself and his family by defending a black family. But no one was going to tell him who he could love. Mm. You, let's see, you start each of the chapters in the book with a Bible verse or Bible verses. I am sorry, multiple Bibles, normally about three Bible verses. And then you <clears throat> give the line about what happened. I'll read it for listeners on the third Sunday after Easter Whew, close timing in 1899, about 40 miles Southwest of Atlanta near Newman, Georgia, a white crowd burned to death a black laborer known as Sam Hose, real name Tom Wilkes. The atrocity blended anger, contempt, brutality, festivity, and satisfaction into a mood just beyond comprehension. Glory, shouted an excited man, enraptured by the intensity of the moment. Glory be to God. Why do you start all the chapters with different Bible verses and then a reminder about this shout of glory be to God for each chapter? To make the point, um, to make the point, uh, the important shout was not just a shout at that time. Um, but each of the Bible verses uh, is a condemnation uh, as well as a justification for uh, violence. But most of them, I tried to, I chose the, the Bible verses uh, that. Uh, would put uh, the people who did the lynching in, in shame. That's what I intended to do. Uh, for example, the Proverbs, uh, quotation on the first chapter, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed in, from their filthiness. And that is what this book is about. A generation that is pure in its own eyes but is not washed they're not aware, not aware that they had been not washed of their filthiness. And that's the point of each chapter. Hmm. Wow. Wow. You, the, uh, this is from chapter one before the burning Southern mastery. Page yeah. 15. Uh, you write the crowd, according to partisans, represented an enraged community that demanded swift and brutal action. 
The accusation of rape was standard fare in the folklore of Southern lynching, but students of collective violence have authored offered other explanations beyond the specific excuses for this event perhaps it was from within the long perspective of history one of many recurring outbursts of brutality inherent in the ways whites had ruled blacks since enslaving them or perhaps the act was an atavistic remnant of rural culture untouched by the progress of industrializing America or it was the exact opposite, that is, action consistent with the cultural logic of a modernizing nation. Or it was a celebration of what it meant to be white. Or it was democracy in action, whatever it was. The lynching was not unexpected and not without precedent. Now, for people who listen to the cows, that is a question I ask all the time. What does it mean to be white? Now, it could be a little bit of all of these is going on here. But I mean, hey, is that the lynching of Sam Hose? Is that what it means to be white? It was then, and it probably could be now in some ways. Can you give us more detail, Dr. Matthews? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, there's a book by uh, a woman I, I just met because I... Uh, I liked it so much. The name was, uh, uh, I forgot, uh, uh, Ms. Orr, or, who teaches at Arizona State. And she talks about lynching now, um, but she talks about it in terms of uh, uh, authority, of, 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 of the police, and the use by authority uh, of violence against uh, uh, people. And I was thinking of that, I think, probably when I wrote that, um, and I would still stand by it. Um, we, I mean, one of the things that struck, that strikes me right now in terms of the misinformation, disinformation that is going on in the country is that the disinformation and misinformation of racism and white supremacy in the 1890s, that, I, w- I was just, it was, a, it was a canopy of lie about white, black, black people. It was a canopy. There was no way, I mean, even the people who opposed lynching uh, were, were, would have, supported the death penalty for rape even if the the black man actually uh, had not been uh, guilty of rape but simply of being black in a bad situation Um, I was reaching uh, I was reaching for uh, the continue the continuity of uh, of racism I didn't want people to think, or didn't want people to think, actually, that racism was over, lynching was over, hatred was over, supremacy was over. I didn't want people to think that, because it isn't. Uh, We can find different ways of uh, thinking of violence against black people now, and the refusal of white people to believe black people. Uh, the ways in which the media will uh, be scandalized by the rape and murder of a blonde white woman but not care about the rape and brutalization of a black woman. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of assumptions about what you choose to talk about, and we often only uh, include African Americans or people of African descent or of other 
um, 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 groups of people, other ethnicities. So you think of them as uh, other, and uh, that uh, allows us to dismiss them, ignore them, tell lies about them, and be offended if we ever defend them. I mean, it's uh, it's almost. I find myself sometimes almost unable to think about the ways in which racism still affects and covers and hovers and rewards uh, uh, white people and white supremacists in this society. Uh, we have we have uh, hundreds of thousands of people right now who think that the government helps black people, but not them. Well, that's stupid. It's crazy, but it's re- it's real. I can't change that. I don't know how to change that. I wish someone would change that. That is what uh, critical race theory is trying to change, and that you have uh, Republican legislators and some Democratic as well, I suspect, uh, passing laws saying you cannot teach critical race theory, which means that you cannot support, you cannot teach about white supremacy and you certainly cannot condemn it. And that is what we are passing laws to do right now. I mean, you, if the best example of the continuity of, of racism in this country are Republican legislators who passed this legislation. It is just outrageous. Context of white supremacy. Dr. Ursula Orr uh, at Arizona State. Yeah, that's the supremacy. woman. I, I uh, forgot. I forgot her first name. Uh, she, I want to say that Miss Orr, uh, and also in emails from her, uh, I've I never met this woman. Uh, I'd love to. <laughs> I think she's great. Uh, she won an award for that book. And uh, that uh, that is one of the most important books I have read in the last 10 years. And uh, I, I just love her. I, as I say, I've never met her, but uh that that book and the articles she sent me she she is on target she is on target right on folks can uh look online and they will see dr ursula or you'll find her great scholarship on lynching they'll also see her being pummeled by enforcement officers in arizona on yes. video uh where they said yes. she was not walking appropriately on the sidewalk that right there now what does it mean to be white and I suspect they probably are not ignorant about what does she do work on is she here at Arizona State studying physics is she here at Arizona State studying physical therapy oh you're the nigger woman who's studying yeah <laughs> get on the side anywho uh, you have we talk about metaphors on this broadcast all the time and the importance of words you in the book, I thought this was important because I think this still happens today. Dylan Stormroof, yes. right next door to you. But you said, uh, whites transform the word rape from an act of brutality against women into a metaphor of black empowerment. Can you deconstruct yes. that? Just after the Civil War, The, uh, there were abolitionists and others and blacks, uh, black activists, who wanted uh, the vote for African American men. And every time this came up, uh, eventually you'll have white editorial, white representatives, white leaders saying they want to rape. It is rape. Giving black men the vote in 1868 was, according to the people who opposed it, as they wrote about it over and over and over again, it was rape. And that's what I meant by that. It They were using they were using uh, the accusation of rape, 
But the metaphor of rape as a way of talking about what blacks <laughs> were doing to them by voting, which was to claim equality. And that's, I, I got, I, I that, you know, that was not my original uh, uh, insight. I, I got that from um, uh, people who I read and studies that, uh, that uh, women have made of, uh, of African American life and of uh, uh, the, the period after the Civil War. Uh, it, 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 it's a it's a it's a generation in which they found a way to um, describe um, what anything that the black men wanted as rape, uh, and. Uh, it's not just a metaphor. It becomes an accusation, and it becomes a way of, um, of justifying uh, violence. Uh, that um, it's a, quite amazing, as a matter of fact, from our viewpoint. It's amazing. It really is. And that's that's. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm. I'm trying to reach a uh, a metaphor. Of the present, uh, like that, but I can't write off hand and think of one. And that's what I meant. And that's what these uh, scholars who I rely on have, have meant when they talk about rape as a political, uh, as a political act, as a political metaphor, as a political goal. Context of white supremacy. Words, uh, people who listen to the cows like words. There are certain terms that she used in this text that pop up like, wow, this is, these are like signals from the creator. That's all I can interpret. Like, wow, you are supposed to be reading this book at this moment and not one second sooner. One of them was shot in Freud because I just said that yesterday. Another one was, uh, fe- oh my God, for listeners. Feverish. I mentioned the late Pamela Evans Harris. How many times have we said that word? If we had time, I'll even have to bring that up. But feverish coming up in the 1900s. To anyway, Pamela Evans Harris. You uh, you already mentioned Cora Harris, Lundy Harris. Uh, this is fascinating. Before we get to Sam Hose, uh, this is on page. Uh, a Southern woman explains from page 57 in the chapter Sex, Danger, and Religion. Facing a savage fury, uh, you write black women were to blame. Cora Harris huffed. They had birthed yeah. the brute yes. who was invariably a bastard and probably the offspring of a bastard mother. In this case, probably meant always. She imagined a deep seated licentiousness in black people passed on from generation to generation. Had she been writing a century later, she might have cited the taint in black women's DNA. Although she also conceded white men's participation in beginning it, these men, she explained, had bequeathed to their mulatto sons a Caucasian audacity. That is amazing. I'm going to use that one. That compelled the latter to rape white women. Mothers of rapists had seduced white men. <laughs> Let me read that one more time. Mothers of rapists had seduced white men and trained their own families in unrestrained sexuality, which had produced a vast cesspool of vice. I'm just giving out a few paragraphs before I (laughs) continue to give (laughs) a little bit more. Just let me give a little bit more before you respond. She says, if Harris denounced the debased motherhood of the Negro race, she conceded that it was possible to think of a woman from within that milieu as a victim hardened by crimes and poverty. Such a woman could be prey to the first white wretch who approaches her with deceitful kindness. Harris seemed to concede white men's abuse of young black women. The former's presence hovered over everything she wrote, 
but she ignored its implications conceding white men's sexual predations she could write about the scar of the lash inflicted by masters but never think about the power of white rapists I did mention Strom Thurmond and torturers the editor pointed out that her essay implied an indictment of white men she herself was unable to issue I'll stop there now let's hear Dr. Matthews Cora Harris's husband is the subject of those articles when she says uh, uh, something about the uh, wretch who approaches her with deceitful kindness pray to the first wretch who approaches her with deceitful kindness. She's talking about her husband. He had sexual relations with many black women, and he spent a lot of time in brothels. This is a college professor and uh, ordained minister. minister. Uh, and she was furious uh, at, uh, at him. Um, because he confessed everything, and he got he he was removed. He was fired from Emory College uh, for his uh, discretions, uh, indiscretions. And um, she wrote this a year after this. Uh, the, her husband had been fired. She wrote this a year afterwards. They had been separated. My point is, I the reason I talked about Cara Harris and her husband in that way is I wondered how many white women in the South at the time supported lynching not because of anything that had to do with what had happened out there, but what had happened within their own families. I'm, I'm, I, I raised the question. I don't answer it because I don't know. But I, I I think that a lot of women supported lynching as a way of of somehow punishing their husbands, even though they killed black men in, in the process. Um, I, I think that you know, Cara Harris at, at the end of her life, Cara Harris says the, uh, something in defense of W. E. B. Du Bois. That's a that's a real change over thirty years. Um, she was angry at that time about her husband, but she hated black women because she thought she she blamed the black women for seducing her weak husband. She knew how weak her husband was actually, and I think I I just think there's an emotional tide there that we haven't thought much about. And I can't really document in many ways. You'd have to do it case by case, and I can't do that. Uh, but I, 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 I do think that uh, you, you, people want to blame black people for things that the black people didn't have any idea of doing. I think that, 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 that what Karen Harris has to leave the home that she's had for 12 years because her husband got in, had a sexual liaisons with black women and admitted it and she didn't hold him she said he's not he's not unchaste now how, how can you say that about a husband who is having affairs and is having intercourse with uh, black women now she, she that's part of the that's part of the 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 problematic i think of uh, white white racism you you have a way of blaming black people for something they don't even do and i think that whites white love that that's why they have all this condemnation of critical Race theory. That isn't about critical race theory. They don't know shit about critical race theory. What they're trying to do is to blame black people for making them uncomfortable in the society in which they want to rule. And that's the bottom line. Mm. Dr. Donald G. Matthews, author of At the Altar of Lynching. 
alumnus UNC Tar Heels. Uh, on page one, 86, excuse me, I got the wrong page. 86, so you, you go into more detail about this. This whole story I found fascinating because I was, I was almost Dr. Matthews. I'll tell you the truth. I was reading this. I was like, what, what is going on? Like, I thought we were reading about San Jose. We deviated. Who are these people? And then I was like, oh my God, look at this, man. You got to be patient sometimes. You read. So on page 87, you write, she, Cora, had undoubted, Cora Harris, undoubtedly had been thinking about the matter from the moment she began to reflect on the black women whom Lundy had detailed to so many men. The couple separated to find gainful employment teaching. Distance allowed her to avoid the censorship his presence would have imposed. Adultery in black women dominated her ma- imagination more than the adulterer. To be sure, she conceded a black woman could be seduced by the first wretch who approaches her with deceitful kindness. Cora may have recalled ways in which her husband had relaxed among black women servants. Oh, Lundy may have been all too willing to offer a deceitful kindness that allowed them to accept greater intimacy than Christian decorum permitted. It was their fault. Lundy did not agree. My conduct, he raged to Candler, was a criminal before God as if a white woman had been involved. He was ashamed of what he had done to the poor, wronged Negroes. Cora was shamed by what they had done to her. Now, slow down on this one. I have to remind folks now. The reason we're reading Dear Essie, or excuse me, Dear Senator, when we had Dr. J. Russell Hawkins on the program, we talked about all this again. Strom Thurmond. In fact, he in his book, page after page after page of the exact same thing. Oh, my God, Senator Thurmond, they're going to rape our little girls and we can't have these nigger children in school. They're going to rape our girls. They're going to rape our girls. In fact, he said, are you going to put your daughter? On a school bus at 6 a.m. The sun is up and have some Negro bus driver with your little girl on the school bus. Are you going to do that? You got to save us, Strom Thurmond. I mean, he writes a whole book about this. He doesn't include yeah. one word. Oh, by the way, when we're making all these appeals to Strom Thurmond about raping black males, Strom Thurmond raped Essie Mae Washington's mother, Carrie Butler, who's 15 at the time. He's 23. This is total. He totally leaves that out. This, in my opinion, this is another one. Words are accurate. None of it. This is not an affair. This is not a. This That's is not, rape. Right. Yeah. Even because he said these are married women too. So I mean, at this time period, so in eighteen whatever we want to call this, eighteen ninety five. So if they had said, "Get out of here, Lundy Harris. I'm a married woman. Don't you talk to me that way." Really. Isn't this rape? Is that accurate, Dr. Matthews? I think it is, yes. You didn't use that term in the book. How come? I have no idea. (laughs) I have no idea what I left out. This is a wide pattern, and I'm calling the same thing that I said with Dr. Uh, Hawkins like two weeks ago, basically. Um, Him not he didn't even not call it rape. He left it out completely. And I asked him. He said he. Oh yeah, I'm aware of this. I went to South Carolina. I saw S. E. May Washington's name is on the statue that they didn't take down. Uh, for Strom Thurmond, her name is on the statue, so I knew about this. He said he didn't know about the age difference that Carrie Butler was actually 15, uh, and so that this is child rape, not just rape. Uh, this is very. I mean, you want to talk about a long pattern? They do the same thing with Thomas Jefferson. They maybe bring up Sally Hemings, but they don't say this is rape. No qualifying, no euphemism. This is not a romance. This is not an affair. Ra- child rape. It's the same exact thing with Strom Thurmond. Sally Hemings, 14, 15 years old, and she's his wife's half sister. So this is like incest, child rape with Thomas Jefferson. This gets left out every time by people who know this information. Uh, Dr. Matthews, you're a historian. 
you've observed this pattern where white people consistently leave out that white people are not just sexually exploiting black people. This is rape. And in many instances, this is child rape of black boys and girls by white men and white women. Is that accurate? I, I suspect you've got a situation here in which the white the whites are in a supreme supremacist position so that any sexual encounter is by that reason a rape. Yes. When when whites uh, uh, I don't I don't know what I don't know exactly what Lundy did. I do know um, that um, if you're in a situation of power, uh, if you're a, a professor and you have uh, a, a situation with uh, people who are dependent upon you, uh, that in, the encounter can become uh, a violent uh, not, uh, it can become a rape in that uh, this is not what <laughs> the woman wanted to this is not the situation the woman wanted to be in this is a situation which the uh, the person who has the power has placed them in and he is exploiting them and he is he is den- he is de- denying them uh, their right to a free choice and that uh, if uh, it is is in, in in whole range of possibilities can be interpreted as rape. Yes, very important. I also think it's important uh, why people leaving this information out on a consistent uh, basis. Uh, in in <clears> fact, <throat> let me make me back up to make sure I get one more listeners. If you have a question that you'd like to get in for uh, Doctor Matthews, the number is seven two zero. Seven one six seven three hundred. The code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. Uh, this is. I'm just backing up a little bit. This is on page. <laughs> Make sure I give out the because this comes up a few times where different white people are maybe being accused of maybe they've uh, engaged in some sort of incorrect sexual behavior. So this comes up a little bit later, but same thing. Uh, Bishop James Osgood Andrew, uh, yeah. who discovers, disco- he discovers that, oh, I've become a slaveholder. <laughs> like, that is a new one. I've become a slaveholder. Yeah. Like, yikes, yeah. my wife is own slave. Now we're married, so I guess I'm a slave owner. Dang. Well, I am, but I didn't want to be in all this. Anyway, so you go on. Uh, maybe he was a master. He admitted, but only accidentally and reluctantly. He still felt compelled to admit being a slaveholder was a burden rather than the stewardship pro-slavery theorists claimed. Uh, so I'm gonna get in that. The bishop had acted responsibly, he claimed, and the young girl, her name is Kitty, was enslaved only in law, not reality. Andrew neglected to tell the conference that he was also actually, if not legally, the master of 14 other slaves. Deception. In response to what was known at the time, the Yankee-dominated general conference asked the bishop to suspend his labors until he had rid himself of his impediment, that is, his slaves. Abolitionist extremists had created a martyr. Kitty, that's the young slave, became a petted servant who cared for Andrew's wife and lived in freedom in a little house on the bishop's property until she died victorious in the faith. When Cora and Lundy settled in Oxford, the story had been told, retold, improved, and polished by villagers into a morality play of Yankee hypocrisy and Southern duty. White Methodist sentimentalism remembered Andrew as a Christ figure, noble man. He suffered himself accursed for the sake of his brethren and his kinsmen. He was never heard to utter a word of complaint. The story was inspiring, but African Americans may have had a different version. Since the tight little community knew of many erotic crossings of the collar line, and I see that, that right there. I'm going to read the rest of this, but that's what I mean. Erotic crossings of the collar line? 
all this flowery language and are we talking about rape when white people come over in the slave quarters or come to the Negro side of town and I can't just say hey Lundy get out of here Bishop James get out of here I'm a married woman or what? Oh, right. hey hey yeah, just get out of my house true. it's not erotic crossings of the color line that's so in my view all of this that is white supremacy racism right there we're being we're well, pussyfooting if the reader can't if the reader cannot understand that then they're not a good reader. This is not about a reader having comprehension skills. This is about using correct terms to make sure that we are calling attention to an explicit power relationship and erotic crossings of the color line. That's in the same line as Dr. J. Russell Hawkins. No mention at all of, oh, yeah, Strom Thurmond was a hypocrite and raping these black females, a child, no less. But let me read the rest of it. Uh, since the tight little community knew of many erotic crossings of the color line in and around Oxford. Shouldn't we be suspicious of Andrew's special care for Kitty? This is a question that a recent student had asked because it flows from the conventional wisdom of black folks based on the experience of generations. Now, this is yeah. one that I highlighted because this to me sounds like black people are more informed about this. That's they not are the more case. Oh, about hang on, let me it. finish and I'm going to get your response. That is not possible. J. Strom Thurmond's family, they weren't ignorant about S.E. May Washington. They lied about it. He wasn't ignorant about this, nor were any of his family, even though they questioned and thought, even reported, S.E. May Washington is out here lying, seeing that she's Strom Thurmond's daughter. Yeah. And then they finally relented when she said, hey, let's do the DNA test. And then it was, oh, OK, well, I've been giving out payments. The same thing that I said before, white people lie. You can't be white and be ignorant about racism. And you can't be white and be ignorant that we've been raping black people for a long time. There's a difference between I'm white and I know that we rape black children all the time. We've been doing this for centuries. We just don't talk about that. We don't call it rape. We call it erotic crossings of the color line. That's I was different talking from, about a specific Hang on situation. a second. I'm going to let you respond. That's very was, different from we don't know this information and pretending like black people are the ones who are informed about these rapes and we have to learn this from them that's something that I'm calling out as that doesn't make any sort of logical sense if you're raping a black person you know what you did with your penis even the black females you know what you did with your vagina now am am I being logical Dr. Matthews if not you tell me where I'm being illogical inaccurate uh, no, no. You're being logical according to a, a certain line of reasoning. What you ignore from the fact that is black people understood what was going on, and that's what I said. Uh, white people, I think you miss what white supremacy does to the supremacist. It colors everything they do so that they don't see what they do in the way that you want to see it. They don't see it the way blacks do. Blacks understood what was going on. No question about it. When Carrie, when Lundy Harris's cousin became president of the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching, she said, the race problem can never be solved as long as the white man goes unpunished for crimes against black people and loses no social standing while the Negro is burned at the stake. Parks knew what she was talking about. She had been deeply mortified by Hunt, Hunt Lundy Harris's behavior. He was her cousin. That was my point. She knew what was going on, and she believed black people. She didn't believe Carl Harris, and she did, didn't believe Lundy. But she especially didn't believe... Uh, Cara Harris and women like her. Black people said it was rape. Yes, it was. That's what they said. They were right. White people didn't say that. I tell what people say. I don't necessarily agree with what they what they say, 
<laughs> what they the way they deal. Uh, I I was preachy enough in this <laughs> damn book. Uh, I, I didn't go need, need to go uh, uh, preaching on every page, although a lot of people think I did. Erotic so, crossings of the color line is not in quotes. Those are your words, and again, yeah, it's my, they're my I'm, words, and I stand by them. Right That's on. what the whites. That is what the whites thought. That's what I'm writing about. I'm talking about what whites doing. I'm not a black person. I'm talking about white people. Yes, sir. The that blacks, was one of the first and questions. And I say the blacks, the blacks knew what was going on. If I didn't say it the way you wanted me to say it, uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I said it that way. It's out there. There's nothing I can do about it. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I'm going to make a lot more, I hope. Uh, and I intend to actually make more mistakes. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to... Uh, uh, there are a lot of things in this book that are not right. There are a lot of things in this book that are mistaken. There's no question about that. I'm a white man. I can't pretend I'm not. <laughs> that would be stupid. Hmm. I was just going to say, that was one of the first questions that I asked. I certainly didn't forget. You didn't just say that you're a white man. You say that you are very white. And I just want to make sure right. I point to listeners. I'll get a call before we get to our listeners, I'm not saying that the black people are ignorant about all this. The point that I'm making, you yourself, other individuals classified as white, they are not ignorant about this either. Now, you said that white people can choose not to see things. I'm very sure Strom Thurmond can see, oh, I got my penis in this teenage black female who works for me. I'm very sure Lundy Harris can see, Ooh, I got my penis in this married black female. None of these folks can tell me, no, I'm a white man. Or I could be a That's white woman said. and it still yeah, apply. So that. They're not ignorant. I, I, I allowed you to talk. I didn't interrupt. Uh, they're not ignorant about any of this. Now, if I choose to lie about that, that's very different than being ignorant. There is a long pattern that goes all the way up of white people, yourself included, J. Russell Hawkins, they choose, as you said, to use your verbiage, not to preach about white people raping and especially black children. They get very euphemistic and pussyfooting with the language or just totally leaving it out. And I'm pointing out that that's a major act of white supremacy. Racism is not dependent on black people being informed and telling us about this, that that's how we come to think about it. It's oh yeah, this is how we practice racism by deliberately obfuscating, minimizing, and or calling these relationships, affairs, and all the rest. It's rape, and it's often child rape every time. Uh, the number is 720-716-7300. Decode 564-9. Pound. Press star six one if you have a question for Doctor Doctor Donald G. Matthews, author of At the Altar of Lynching. Uh, let's see our caller in New Jersey. Make sure I'm nabbing as we go. Our caller in New Jersey, victim. Uh, good luck with the PT. Did you have a question for Doctor Matthews? You should be with us, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Doctor. Uh, how everyone's doing? Um, question. Um, what's the, what's the definition of lynching? What, what is what, lynching? I couldn't hear the question. No, I'm sorry. I couldn't I hear the what question. Is, what is lynch- oh, I'm sorry. What is lynching? Or what is your definition of lynching? What? What? I don't, what, what is your lynching definition just- of lynching? I'll just repeat it for you. What is your definition of lynching? That was his question. Uh, oh, um, there are different, <laughs> there are all kinds of definitions of lynching, unfortunately. Um, the NAAC, as I recall, uh, NAACP, uh, a lynching took place, there had to be a death. Um, and it, it was uh, three or more white men 
against a black person, uh, and uh, it, there had to be a death. Uh, the Ohio law about lynching uh, said it, it was not only a death, um, but it was um, brutality as well, the, the attempt to kill, attempt to murder. Um, and I pr- provide both of those uh, definitions, I think, in the beginning. My own definition, uh, my own, I mean, you're asking me to, to select, I'm a historian. I, I record what people do, said, and thought, did. Um, and uh, if I want to think that my grandfather was brutalized by a mob, and I want to call it lynching, uh, I, I, I explained, I think, I, I, I've been talk, uh, writing about this uh, 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 recently, and because I, 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 I've read a book, a book, uh, several books recently, uh, about five or six of them on, on lynching, um, and some people insist on the killing, some people not. It doesn't make any difference what I think a lynching was. I think that if you have a collective action by white people to destroy other white people, other people, other people. Uh, uh, illegally, uh, that's a lynching. I don't, I don't care whether they did or didn't. Uh, but other people would disagree with me. The NAACP did in the 1920s and 30s. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to defer to that. I just, but uh, I'm willing to say that's a uh, <laughs> that's a contested issue. And then some people think that way, and one other people think otherwise. A historian is not in the position of imposing. The, the correct definition on things. Uh, and that's not our responsibility. I may think something uh, is awful and uh, dispirited and evil, uh, uh, but if I describe it and show how evil it was, I don't have to say, look at this. I just told you something was evil. Oh, give me a break. Uh, Lynching is a collective action against somebody. They attempt to kill somebody. Uh, it, if you want to say that it's you have to kill someone, that's your position. You can have that position. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I, I, that's that's all I can say. My, I, the, I, I, uh, the, the definition of lynching is, is. I think people can understand what it is. I think right now, uh, having read uh, Arthur Orr's book uh, on lynching at the present time, I've been trying to think of a new definition uh, because uh, um, I've been impressed by the way in which African American and people of African descent and uh, their white allies, I think, too, uh, have pointed out uh, that uh, violence by the police, that is, by authority uh, against uh, black people, uh, is is a lynching, and I I am I am come to believe that myself. I, I do believe that, but I haven't defined it yet. I don't know. I've got to figure out. Uh, you have to realize that when uh, the lynching was taking place. The, the, uh, there were legal lynchings. I mean, that is, there were uh, trials in which uh, black men were condemned to death for doing something um, that was all figured of the lie. I mean, it, it was it, it was legal. It was a legal action, but it was lynching. Uh, and I think that I have to transfer that into the current. Uh, situation, and I think I think that George Zimmerman and, and Trevon, uh, that situation in which he killed this kid, uh, I think that would be a lynching. But I can't find a way to define it. Uh, I'm reaching for a definition that would include it. I haven't settled on that yet. That's the only okay. thing I can say. Okay. Um, 
Okay. I, I have two more questions because I, I I had three, but I'm gonna try to get these in um, because you closed and you, you kind of answered what I was gonna ask. I, um, I can't. I, I, next. I, Gus, can you? Yes, sir. When he gets his question, yeah, sorry, if you could just I'm... get to the question, that yeah. way I can repeat. Yeah, I'll get to the okay. question. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, okay, today, like when we talk about uh, critical race theory, and um, and do you think that the media is also complicit in causing confusion as we talk about lynching and just the history of lynching and how it relates to today? And if that is true, well, let's do one at a time. That, let's do one at a time. Okay. Let's do one at a time. Okay. Okay. So the question, <laughs> Doctor Matthews, was: uh, Do you think the media is also complicit in causing confusion about what a lynching is? I don't think the media is a relevant concept. I think there are people who write. And talk in, the, in in television and radio and in print, uh, who create a lot of confusion. But I can't condemn all the media because there are some people out there who don't do that. Uh, so it has to be certain people. I don't blame I don't blame the media for anything. I blame specific uh, maybe people or specific organizations. Uh, but I don't think that I could say that the media creates the confusion. There are a lot of stupid people in this country that are easily confused. And so, uh, and, and, and there are people who write, uh, in television, radio, and, and the print who do their best to confuse. But I don't think, quote, the media is responsible. I think those people are responsible. I think Fox News is responsible, but I don't think other people are responsible. Okay, Professor, uh, my last question. Um, so basically, the stupid people are the most powerful as people um, with that, you know, with, with that um, answer. So I got a question. So if they are stupid people that have the responsibility of writing the news, do you yes. think that Gus, that being though that Gus wanted, wanted writers such as yourself and others to be Pacific when you're explaining certain issues or hold you accountable when you omit certain information that can basically better educate white people and black people who are victims of racism? I still don't know what the question is. I'm sorry. What? Gus? Oh, let's see. What? He's... He said, if I got it, you can let me know if I'm repeating it correctly. Uh, if the stupid people, in quotes, I think using your words, if the stupid people are writing the news and they're using inaccurate terms or what have you to describe racism, uh, people like myself uh, and others, uh, when they interview writers such as yourself, Dr. Matthews, uh, when we are picking out specific places uh, where you're not using correct terms, attempting to hold you accountable, do you think that that is correct behavior, constructive? People can challenge me in, in anything. I mean, that's correct behavior. People should challenge people. I, I'm a historian. I, <laughs> I, 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 as I said, I did take homiletics, and I do preach too much. Uh, and I try very much not <laughs> to preach any more than I possibly do. Uh, and if you think I haven't been preachy enough, that's your position, and that's quite all right. Uh, and you can hold me as accountable as you want to. I don't give a shit. Uh, uh, people, uh, uh, can, people can disagree. People can accuse. They can counter accuse. They can say, well, you're not being good enough. Well, no, I'm not being good enough about a lot of things. I've made a lot, as I said, I've been a lot of mistakes and, and, uh, I've said a lot of things I <laughs> probably shouldn't have said. Probably in, in lectures as well as in print. So so people can challenge me, and they can correct me, and they can say I'm a bad person. So I'm a bad person. I have no, I have no, I have no uh, hesitation in saying that I am a sinner. 
I am an abject sinner, and I need to be forgiven. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, my question wasn't basically say whether you were good or bad. It was to create balance. And by creating balance, you know, basically... Did you have another question, sir? Kind of just- no, 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 that's it. Okay. Then this time, for sure, if he can't hear you or what have you, because then, you know, um, much obliged victim in New Jersey. I'll just clarify for myself. Uh, I never said that Dr. Matthews or anyone else was not preachy enough or was not a good person or that he was a sinner. Uh, what I pointed out was not using correct terms in describing racism, white supremacy, which is very specific. Uh, let's see the person who dialed in from what is this five six four zero five six four zero did you have a question for dr matthews you should be with us hello can you hear me yes ma'am yeah hi yeah thank you gus uh hello to the guest dr matthews um are you familiar with hi sir are you familiar with the case of george stinney george who george stinney the uh uh-huh Oh, what's the last name? Stinney, S-T-I-N-N-E-Y. No, I don't know anything about that. Uh, he's the only child to have been officially executed um, back uh, in 1944. Uh, whites accused him of killing two uh, white girls. And he mm-hmm. was executed in 1944 at the age of 14. Uh, I was going to ask if you were familiar with that case, if you no. if you considered that a lynching. <laughs> I think it's an evil. As I said, I'm trying to, I am trying to find a way, right now, to extend the word lynching to such things. Right now, historians say that is an illi- that is a legal lynching. I'm willing to say that it's a legal lynching. It's legal, but it's a lynching. Yes, there were, I don't know, hundreds, I imagine, maybe thousands of cases like that. Uh, there, the lynch mobs have taken nine-year-old boys. Uh, they have lynched women. They have... Uh, I, I didn't know about this thing with this 14-year-old kid. He's a juvenile. He shouldn't. Uh, you know, nowadays, that would be almost impossible. I'm not sure it would be. Would be. Uh, but uh, yeah, I personally, I think it's a lynching. Yes. Okay. I think there's a lot of legal action by whites in this country against blacks that was lynching. Yes, I believe that. That's what I thought. I just happened to do a study of something that was quite illegal. And I, some of the people who uh, opposed the lynching of Sam, of Tom Wilkes, Sam Hose, uh, said they should have waited for the courts uh, to to decide his case. Well, if they had waited for the courts, he would have been executed. What I think happened in the case of uh, Tom Wilkes and uh, Alfred Cranford is I think that Cranford, that Wilkes thought Cranford was going to kill him. I think he probably was because uh, Cranford's uncle had, had uh, brutalized a lot of black people and uh, a black person had killed him. Uh, in this case, I think that uh, uh, Tom was simply trying to defend himself, and he got the hell out of there. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, manslaughter in the th- third degree, quite frankly. Uh, would that have been the, the, the decision in 1899? Absolutely not. That would have been a lynching, even though it was by the courts. Yes, there can be legal lynchings. Hundreds of them, I imagine. Great, thank you. Context of white supremacy, much obliged. 
uh, our female caller. Uh, I'm going to nab some of our other callers. I just want to get this uh, passage in from the text, Dr. Matthews. Thanks for hanging out with us on your Sunday afternoon. This is on page uh, 156 at the altar of lynching carnival. Even that word. Mm. Uh, you write uh, the men who were doing I don't know, back up uh, the Jones brothers discovered Tom Wilkes by simply paying attention to detail. They knew there was a reward and they were pleased to receive it, but they had not beaten, been beating the bushes, wading through swamps or shooting at imaginary fugitives. The men were doing those things had found, however, something as valuable as Sam Ho's, a feeling of masculine solidarity. They were emotionally bonded in a short lived but intensely committed moral community based on the presumed rape of Maddie Cranford. The aspiration of the crime, they were told, had to be understood within the context of rising aspirations of, to equality triggered by the presence of U.S. black troops, second time we heard that this week, and sustained by Yankees' mischievous hostility. Public figures such as Governor Candler and Dr. Hal Johnston had, after all, called attention to widespread white vulnerability and black conspiracy after the Griffin incident, alleged Negro arsonist. But it was the rape of a high status white woman by an unknown outsider who men like the Palmetto dentist Johnston claimed was associated with the arsonists that sent hunters scurrying across the countryside. I think this one is important as well, because I think you still see examples of this today. Can you talk about how this kind of, uh, produce this sense of white brotherhood, white masculinity. Yeah, I just can't think of any uh, incidents right now. I'm not. You probably have some in mind, but I. I um, Proud Boys, uh, January 6th. There, there's a, oh, the, the, yeah, the militia movement is a pretty good example of that sort of thing. Um, um, the. Uh, We've got we've got a I don't really understand what's going on in this country right now. Uh, I've been afraid of the militia movement uh, since before the Oklahoma City bombing. And uh, I've known people, I think, uh, when I grew up with in Idaho who would, uh, would join them. I remember being in Idaho uh on um uh, way out in the desert <laughs> and confronting about 15 men with rifles uh who scared the bejesus out of me and uh i thought that that moment in time it was a long time ago uh but the militia movement had just been uh, discovered i think by the media and uh uh they it it <clears throat> I think that's probably true. I, 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 there's, there's a book. <clears throat> I forgot the it's up in my library, but a book called Lynching uh, to uh, to Belong. And uh, one of the uh, one of the men who were was primary uh, activist in the lynching of Tom Wilkes uh, was a man by the name of uh, uh and he would just come from my, my my editor found he had just come from Poland and uh, he'd come to Pen- New York and he'd come into Pennsylvania and apparently he'd gone down south and I think he was one of the people in Griffin that was uh, a leader of, of some of the stupidest things that was going that was going on and of the most evil evil thing that was going on and he led the the the, the attack on on. Uh, on, on Sam Hose, the man he calls Sam Hose, um, and uh, yeah, I I think I think that, um, that that when you get into a situation uh, that you can justify and then you bond together with us doing the right thing, uh, quote right thing, and bond together, it's a part of the bonding, and you're creating. Uh, a moral community, uh, a community held together by the morality. 
based upon their masculinity. And I think that uh, you're probably right that that uh, I would say that the Q and on the Proud Boys and uh, any number of these people who brandish uh, their weapons and, and wear camouflage and uh, march up and down in front of my house with submachine guns um, in Raleigh. Uh, I was frightened, frightened by them. I don't really was. Uh, yeah, I, it, 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 uh, I, I, I think that that this is uh, uh, could very well be. I, I, I would have to see an analysis of this. In fact, I probably would agree with it, but I, 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 uh, I uh, you know, I haven't really thought that much about it right now. Um, I think you're rightly right you know, to see this uh, everywhere we are. We have a fascist movement in this country. Uh, you have uh, at, the, at, the, at the top of the Republican Party, and then you have um, different groups below that that are uh, willing to uh, uh, flaunt their so-called masculinity by behaving and acting and saying things uh, that are quite uh, quite evil and quite... Uh, Dangerous, and uh, uh, I suspect that it, it is a, a, a really a grown-up version of, uh, of "I'm the King of Bunker Hill." Hmm. Context of white supremacy. Just before I nab our next caller, be in Santa Rosa. You're on deck. Just that same theme of white brotherhood, white masculinity. Uh, this, even though there are women present. Um, in this poll situation and what have you, some of the women and children come out to waves. Oh, they're going to lynch Sam Hose and make it a picnic. Um, but this is uh, a very homosocial, homoerotic white male endeavor, even though you also write about some black males going out to help them participate and, and track down, find uh, Sam Hose. Uh, you yeah. just want to comment on the the souvenir aspect of all of this we read the book Delectable Negro and that comes up so many times and that seems to be a part of the bonding and even the what does it mean to be white I want to read a few of these and in fact get my sound clip in as well but I'm uh, kind of over page 166 so this is at the altar of lynching butchery, fire, rape sacrifice and truth on 166 uh, you right? <clears throat> or he made out of it on April 23rd, 1899, all black men in Coweta, Campbell and Spalding counties were legitimate prey to white men driven by the testosterone of racial contempt. Skipping yeah. down a little bit, a few men ran to a nearby country store to pilfer ga- uh, kerosene and confiscate a cord or so of dry split pine from the yard of Joe Featherstone, a local cotton buyer. The the crowd then claimed a clearing in nearby woods with a sapling at its edge about 50 feet from the highway. They chained their victim to the sapling and stacked the wood about him. Those with knives then fell on their victim. They cut away his humanity as they forced a bloodied Tom Wilkes to enter American history as Sam Hose. They consecrated the space and carved their whiteness on him by mutilation. They broke him into bits sliced him into portions grasped parts of him as souvenirs or sold him off at 10 to 25 cents a piece yeah I'm just skipping over uh, the page a little bit or actually skipping down this is on 168 oh I can't believe that one it's given that 169 sorry I'll get back to that 169 uh, they may have eviscerated as white men cut Tom Wilkes his blood oozed flows and splattered it stained the clothing and soiled the hands of his executioners with what had once been life but was now death blood is tacky that's our word and indelible when it is one's own it is disheartening but in the case of torture and the pain of others it can be exciting even as the abator becomes an altar blood in this sacrifice compensated for the blood in which Maddie Cranford had supposedly been raped 
Sex and violence and blood merged in the vanguard's imagination and consequently in its actions. Men seized parts of Wilkes body, his ears, his fingers, his penis, and his testicles. One can imagine, as William Faulkner once did, that at least one of his torturers could think in a flash, now you'll let white women alone, even in hell. Wilkes tormentors cut or hacked other parts as well. They may have eviscerated him. They could have twisted corkscrews into his flesh or blinded him with acid as other mobs had done before or would do in the future. They could have rolled hot or red hot irons across his body or plunged them into his eyes, mouth, throat, and anus as other whites would do at other times, but they didn't. Like other white men in similar rights, they tortured not to gain knowledge useful for self-defense, but to know Tom Wilkes' body as rampaging rapists and to know what it felt like to inflict pain in a perfect freedom gauged by blood. They ravished him in blood and fire to signify the meaning of crossing sacred boundaries and polluting sacred space. Blood and fire purified them. By cutting him, they did not transform him into a woman. They took his maleness to signify black men as eunuchs before white men. The cutting was destruction, not transformation. The liturgy of bloodletting and rape inscribed on his body white rage, desire, contempt, and transcendence in one horrific moment. The torturers were more obsessed with what they could do to Wilkes' body and therefore his soul self-consciousness than with justice even by their own lax standards. They, like the SS torturers of the Nazi-inspired Holocaust, were intent on proving that there were things considerably worse than death. They were sending a message to African Americans that Rebecca Felton, for one, wanted sent. Horror and terror awaited those blacks who break our white law, which only we can break with impunity because we have created it to enforce our dominion. Lynchers called it justice, but it was really power, contempt, and transcendence. This drama, such as those of executions past, surely would be memorable. Truth came as blood, pain, and glory. My sound clip, and then we'll get Dr. Matthews' response. When I was little, we found a man. He looked like like butchered. The old women in the village crossed themselves and whispered crazy things, strange things. El diablo cazador de hombres. Only in the hottest years this happens. And this year it grows hot. We begin finding our man. We found them sometimes without their skin. And sometimes much, much worse. El que hace trofeos de los hombres means the demon who makes trophies of man. What you will see at the movie theaters in white culture. So the homoerotic nature of white men doing all of this mutilation and general mutilation of black males. Uh, you wrote eloquently about it. Can you give us more detail, Dr. Matthews? Well, I'm not sure I can. Um, no, I, I mean, um, quite frankly, right now, I'm so um, appalled by the re- reading my own work here. Uh, that I can't really think much more. I I read quite a few books on torture. Um, 
I read Aileen Scarry on pain. Um, we, we think of the Holocaust as the worst thing that humans can do. We had a little Holocaust in this country for a long time. And I'm not sure that we can really understand that, that, that. Don't think that we are able to confront that. Um, when you, um, I was talking to my, my physician. My physician is a black woman from Jamaica. And uh, she was with me uh, as I was writing this book. And I remember uh, uh, seeing her one day. Uh, and we got to talking about what I was doing. I said, I'd just been seeing, been reading the Tuskegee uh, accounts of lynchings and that. Uh, and uh, Raquel uh, said, uh, I, I, she said, you've got to take a vacation from this. Uh, it's uh, really affecting you right now, and you have to realize that. Um, I, if you think about this enough, you're going to start weeping. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just terrible. And uh, these, you know, we think that other people are doing these things, and we do it ourselves. We sometimes we do it metaphorically, but in this case, I think in every lynching, but also just the fact of uh, the uh, executions, we uh, seem to delight. Uh, Many millions of people seem to delight in in, in torture and and uh, and and death and um, I don't know. We've got a whole culture right now of people who think we haven't been aggressive enough about certain things. We hadn't been, and you know, I keep thinking about what uh, this determination to uh, um, kill is, is affected our culture. My great-grandfather was a, uh, my, my mother's side, uh, was a, a rancher in Montana. And he, uh, George Washington Custer bivouacked on his farm. My Great grandfather hated Custer. Uh, he had learned what Custer had done to an Indian village in Colorado, and uh, Grand uh, Eli had had an understanding with uh, Native Americans in that area, and he was protected by uh, the Sioux and the and the Blackfeet. Blackfeet were in Idaho to his west, and um, when. Uh, when Custer was killed, uh, my grandfather drank a drink uh, to Sitting Bull. He posted Sitting Bull because he could not stand what that man had done uh, to those women and children in, in Colorado. And we, we did, you know, centuries of uh, starting probably in the 1830s, 1630s in, in New England with the Pequot peoples. We burned uh, African um, and burned Indian uh, Native American village, uh, villages. Uh, this country, uh, one of our uh, Richard Slotkin, uh, student of, 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 of violence in this country, has written that we we sought redemption uh, through violence, and um, the uh, there is no redemption in violence, and I. So that when I go through, the, even when I've written this stuff, um, it affects me. I can't really go beyond that. It, it, um, the, the, the current uh, political uh, situation in this country it should frighten us. 
uh, not just racism, but the whole thing of masculinity and <clears throat> power and supremacy. And <clears throat> we, we're, we're not talking to each other because we can't stand each other. And uh, the, the focus on on violence, on, on torture, on lynching, on killing, on execution, on murder. Uh, these things are not something I, when I read, when I confront them, even when I've written about them, it, it's hard for me to think through it uh, critically as I should uh, because it is so horrendous and I am so frightened. And if you're not frightened, you, you you don't know what's going on. Context of white supremacy, uh, being Santa Rosa, you're up now. Just I'm reminded, Guy Lang, Guy Lancaster. He was a guest on our program right at the end of last year, and he was talking about the same subject matter, white terrorism, uh, specifically in the state of Arkansas. And mm-hmm. he said that he had a white woman who contacted him. She said her grandfather passed away, white man, and she was going through his attic stuff, you know, trying to get rid of things. And she discovered a mummified Negro finger and she didn't know what to do with it. And so she contacted the historian. I'm sure that's not the first time. That's one. And then two, uh, just days ago, we had Dr. Gerald Horn on the program. He mentioned Greatest Generation, Nazi Germany. Now, we talked about this exact same subject, but Dr. Horn said, whoa, 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 not Nazi Germany. Other side, allies. He said, hey, when white people, they went over for the Japs, he mentioned Pearl Harbor. Oh, man, it wasn't Nazi atrocities. It was U.S. atrocities. He has that whole section in the book that I read on the program. What did he say? They made a game out of collecting Jap teeth. And they got specific with the rule. See, the white people can't be ignorant about racism. He got specific. He said, hey, the Jap teeth don't count if you get them when they're alive. What does that mean? That sounds like the exact same thing we just read. That means you got to torture somebody if we're pulling teeth out to make a necklace. That should be thought well, about in terms of what does that mean for white culture where you see this over and over and over collection of non white even twenty first century mummified nigra fingers in the attic and we gotta try and make sense of that. I'm sure that's not just one. Anywho, be in Santa Rosa. Did you have a question for Doctor Donald G. Matthews? Uh you should be with us. Hello? Not hearing. There we go. Yes, sir. Uh, Good evening to everybody, host and uh, caller. Um, My question is, what's inside white people that compels them to commit these these lynchings? Did you hear that question, Dr. Matthews? It was, what's what's, inside... What's inside white people? I don't... I don't know what, I don't know that I can answer that I'm not a psychologist. Hello? Hello? Okay. All right. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't, first of all, I don't understand the question, but I'm, if I understand it is what, 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 I mean, the, there are different. I mean, all not all white people are not the same, and all black people are not the same, and all Asians are not the same. Uh, the human condition uh, is managed uh, by people uh, in different ways over a whole range of possibilities, and uh, according to the culture in which uh, in which they uh, live and. And there's a, there's obviously an industrial modern culture. There's a, a difference of opinion to some degree, and we see the differences very vividly in the current United States. So we know what differences mean. Uh, I can't explain. 
I wouldn't even. I mean, I know what person. I know what personally. I think about certain people who I disagree with, but I'm not going to talk about it in public because um, I've got relatives too, you know. And uh, <laughs> uh, I can't general. I mean, I can't generalize. Uh, what, what, there is a strain, there is a streak uh, in in American culture that uh, has gloried in violence almost from the start. Um, there has also been uh, current, in, in kind of a minority kind of way, people who didn't want violence, but who nonetheless benefited from it. And then there are people who came after the violence had occurred, uh, who you know benefited from it, but did, were not aware uh, that either it had happened or that they were benefiting from it. And I think that you know, as we go, as you go through time, you accrue a lot of different sources, especially in a settler society like the United States, so that you got the English and the German ways in. Uh, and uh, uh, early America and uh, colonial period in time. My, my family came in the 18th century uh, various times. And um, other people, I, I had students who told me, oh, damn it, Mr. Matthews, uh, uh, you mean your people, your grandparents were already lived here when, <laughs> when and uh, I said, yes. He said, well, no, my grandparents came from Russia. And uh, I got to thinking about that. You know, we've acquired so many uh, different ethnic uh, cultures uh, and mixed together and, and sometimes coming out in different ways. And, and so we, you know, we have a whole range of possibilities that, it is true that America, that America, the, the, the culture, has sought regeneration through violence. But there have been a hundred, there have been uh, many people who have been opposed to that and hated it and uh, tried to stop it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, they were not successful. Um, the uh, so I can't answer what's inside of of, of people. I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine uh, doing uh, to any human being uh, what was done uh, to people in in lynching. I can't imagine even going to watch it. I can't imagine being there. But um, I'm a white man, and as I said early on, very white. I can't help that. Um the, I can't. I've benefited from it as, as any white person has, but I also know that my grandfather was victimized by it, and uh, I know that uh, um, he uh, he paid for it. He almost paid for it with his life. He didn't. But uh, his family suffered and were impoverished, actually, impoverished at the time. And uh, my 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 father had ran away from home because my grandfather became violent before he settled into a kind of nonchalant idiocy. And um, my grand my father actually was his life was saved by an. Uh, a Cherokee Indian justice, who was also a holy man. Uh, so we, just in my own family, I've run across different ways of dealing uh, or not dealing uh, with uh, uh, with life, and uh, and so I can't, uh, I can't, uh, I can't go into. I, I don't understand the psychology of. Of pain, like say Elaine Scarry does. I don't understand torture. I cannot understand doing what torturers did, uh, and I can't understand executioners either. I mean, a lot of things I don't know, 
And I certainly, uh, I don't know how to answer the question, really. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry, I couldn't. That, uh, I guess he said he wasn't able to answer your question being Santa Rosa. Was that it? That's about all I can say, man. I don't. Oh, I meant I was I, talking to B in Santa Rosa. Was that he said oh, yeah. he heard his response? Was that that during the question, sir? If that's all you can give me, then uh, you know I'll accept it. Um, I have another question. Um, as a historian, what do you suggest black people should do to end racism and white supremacy? I am not in any position to tell white black people what they should do. Not even I'm a not, suggestion. I think I think I no. I think black people are the people who should so, and we should honor that so we should listen to them. I don't think I should give advice to black people. I want them to to assert themselves, I want them to become citizens, I want them to be citizens, I want them to you know, be a major part of this country, I want them to be this country, but I'm not going to tell them how to do it. I can't advise them. They are the people who would do these things. White people don't. We don't. We, we've been advising black people too long. And, uh, Gus, did you ask him a question about who was more confused? No, uh, I sir. I tuned in a little late. No, sir. Uh, okay. All right, that'll be what? it. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't. This is not... <laughs> White people talk too much about what black people ought to do. Black people are telling me what they want to do, I want to listen. Listening is a virtue, and advice giving is not. Uh, before we nab retired firefighter in Florida, uh, the question he was alluding to, Dr. Matthews, who do you think is more confused about racism in terms of what racism is and how it functions? Do you think white people... Are more confused about that, or do you think non-white people are more confused about what racism is and how it works? I, I don't think uh, anybody. I, I think as as a whole, uh, whites are not as aware of what this world is like as as, as African Americans. And Asian Americans and uh, people from Hispanic descent are, I think, I think we, as I said, we don't listen. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's confusion. It's people don't want to know. <laughs> uh, we're not willing. A lot of people are not. We are not. We're not always li willing to listen. And engage and uh, listen, and, you know. Um, but I, you know, I trust. I want to hear what African Americans, my African American friends say. I want to hear what Aaron Booth, <laughs> who comes into my house every day to help me, I want to hear what he has to say. I've known him for 25 years and, uh, He's one of the wonder, most wonderful people I know, and uh, I want to listen to him. I won't tell him what to do. Fascinating. Uh, retired firefighter in Florida, did you have a question for Dr. Donald G. Matthews? <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Uh, to the guests, it is my uh understanding that the president uh, signed into law a bill called a lynching bill 
Uh, and I would like for you to uh, expound on that. You know, <laughs> you know tell us what yeah. your thoughts on. No, I read I read uh, the Times on that, and uh, uh, the columnist I really respect was writing about that this morning. Um, in in the, in nineteen seven in eighteen uh, seventy and seventy one, uh, the Attorney General of the United States tried to use the uh, Reconstruction Acts uh, to uh, stop lynching in uh, in South Carolina, and they held uh, hearings and uh, they acted against uh, uh, those lynchers and held them accountable and. Uh, they didn't get uh, the kind of sentences I think I would have given, but that's beside the point. Uh, the, since that time, uh, the federal government rescinded from doing that. And when I heard that Congress had passed a law, anti-lynching law, uh, I think it's the same kind of uh, response uh, that I had uh, when um, I heard that the, the Senate of the United States had would apologize for slavery. And um, I thought it, it was in 2005, the uh, Senate apologizes to the victims of lynching for the failure of the Senate to enact anti-lynching legislation. That was in 2005. Uh, if they had done so in 1870, I, I think it would have been a better thing. Passing a law against lynching now, ex, ex post facto, they're going to use the definition of lynching, that it has to be done by three feet, over three people, and, and that it has to be a death. They're going, and, 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 it, and it's illegal. They're going to use that as what lynching is. And as uh, the, one of the uh, persons who asked me early on uh, found um, that um, well, I'm, what, we have to rent, reach for a new, new, new definition of lynching that includes violence by authority against, uh, against uh, Af- uh, non-whites. Um, that this uh, this law doesn't really. What does it mean? It means that they were a hundred and fifty years too late. And it's fine that they did that, but it's kind of self congratulatory, isn't it? It's a little late. That's all so, I can say on that. I'm sorry. I think that I cannot expound any further than that. Uh, uh, in the Bible uh, about such things, uh, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If I had lived... In the days of our fathers, we would have not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. That, I think, is a condemnation of too little and too late, if you want to congratulate yourself. This is not a time for self-congratulations on anything like that. It's a hypocritical. So would you say, sir, is a bunch of nothing? I'm sorry. So I couldn't hear what you would say that this law is a bunch of. Oh, I, I don't. I'm glad it's on the books, but I'm not sure it solves anything. That's it. I think you know. It's. Um, it doesn't solve anything. And now it says that we thought that punching is illegal. And now we need to probably get a law to say we need uh, fair justice. And that's a different 
thing entirely. Did you have any other questions? Yes. Retired firefighter. Uh, well, uh, is it a possibility that it would be used against non-white people? That's my last question. Uh, um, well, I, <laughs> I think the law will apply to everybody. Um, uh, I don't. I haven't read the law, so I mean, I just read about the law. I haven't read the law, um, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what that. I don't know what that would mean. It doesn't make. Well, I, I mean, I it. mean, just opposed to the the uh, the law that is identified as hate crime. Uh, it's oh, recently oh. against people, so. I'm just stating is that based on what you have expressed, uh, would that mean the same thing as a possibility with this particular law slash bill? Oh, um, be- I think it, as I said, I don't have read the law. I think it's about a collective, Ill- illegal collective action. Um, I'm not sure it mentions race one way or the other. I, I just don't know. I haven't read the law. Um, okay. And the story I read, I, I, I either read poorly or it wasn't there. Uh, I don't know what the law says about that, but um, um, it, uh, it, uh, it it's I, I think it's probably the same kind of thing as the hate crimes. If that if that's what you mean, I I suspect it's in the same category of crime. And 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 uh, so uh, you know that. Uh, other than that, I don't know how to answer it because I don't know what happened to run the law. I just know it, it outlaws lynching. <clears throat> Which <laughs> uh, look, there have been state laws opposing that outlawed lynching ever since the eighteen uh, eighties and. Uh, they never stop lynching, and so I don't know right. what we've made it a federal crime. If we met, if we have made it a federal crime, uh, then uh, it means that the law is applying to individuals in the state, and that uh, contradicts. One of the worst decisions of the Supreme Court in the 1890s, and it refused to uh, allow uh, the federal government to protect individuals, or lift it up to the states. And if, if this is uh, uh, against that, then um, uh, that is an advance. I never thought of that. It quite possibly is an advance. Still, it, you know, it's 150 years too late. Okay. I, I don't know how else to say about that. You said that was your last question, retired firefighter? Yes, sir. Awesome. Much obliged. Uh, before we let you depart, Dr. Matthews, I am just wanted to verify, was it by chance the New York Times report, this is why it took more than 100 years to get an anti-lynching bill uh, by Jamel yeah. Bowie? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. That column, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right on. I'll post it if listeners want to take a gander. Interestingly, yeah, that's and, a that's and, a good that's a good uh, uh, article. Yeah. Uh, depending on what you're looking for, what I found interesting about it, and I haven't read the whole thing. I was just glancing because I I didn't even know which article you're talking about. I was just trying to see, you know, but I was glancing yeah. over it. Uh, this article, which is kind of lengthy, definitely more than 300 yeah. words. Uh, the word <laughs> racism is not anywhere in this report, and the word white supremacy is nowhere in this report, which is why I would think, ooh, this is going to be just like the hate crimes where a whole lot of black people end up being convicted for lynchings because there's nothing about this that is specific well, I don't, to addressing yeah, I don't. racism, white supremacy. But I didn't want to bog down on that. We heard it. You read well, the paper. It might, it, it might be. I mean, I, that's 
not <laughs> that's not something I I'm right. willing to entertain that as a possibility and I'm willing to think about it. And you haven't read uh, the law. Uh, one thing I did want I to make sure that I got in uh, the victim who was lynched, castrated, mutilated, all of that. His actual name yeah. was Tom Wilkes. But yeah. you talk about the name change and what have you. Why did you go with the title of the book is is Sam Hose as opposed to... Because yeah, let's hear it. Tom Wilkes. I, I thought about it one way or the other. And I went with Sam Hose because that is how the lynching is known. And uh, I wanted to... Uh, associate the book with what people who study such things uh, know about it. Uh, the name Tom Wilkes uh, would would not have indicated to the public, or at least the academic public, that this was about the lynching of Sam Hose. The title, you know, the lynching of Sam Hose is, what, is how this action is known. It's not known as the lynching of Tom Wilkes. But I mentioned Tom's name because I found him uh, in the census uh, returns as a kid, and I thought that people ought to know his real name. And uh, Tom, Tom was um, he was a nice kid, I think. Um, his, his his brother was uh, mentally retarded, I think, uh, challenged, and um, I think he had to take care of. Of him while his mother cooked, and his uh, brother worked for the uh, man who owned the farm. And uh, he decided to leave uh, his, his the, the, the farm, his mother's home, uh, and go to Atlanta. And he remitted to Atlanta, um, and uh, he was. Uh, Slight. He was about five foot seven or eight, and uh, copper, coppery colored, not dark. And uh, he had a mustache, pencil mustache, and he had a hair. Was uh, kind of okrond, and uh, but he, you know, he growing up the way he did, uh, you know, he had a he had an inability to look at white white people he did not know. Uh, in the eye, as a lot of black people did at the time. Uh, and I thought, I know I described him. And that's the kind of person he was, I think. That's about all I know about him. Came from the census records. And then, of course, I just, you know, imagined what he, from the description in the, of him, that what he was like. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I didn't, I, I decided I mean, it was a conscious decision not to say Tom Wilkes, even though I thought it would have been better for the Wilkes family at the time, but we're talking about now. And it's known, the action is known as the lynching of Sam Hose, and I wanted people to know that I'm addressing one of the most uh, infamous uh, lynchings in the South, uh, in the history of lynching, uh, Henry Smith's lynching was probably worse, if you can imagine. Um, uh, but uh, that's why I used the lynching of burning of Sam Hose. Hmm. I'm glad I asked that question. I had this similar uh, dilemma when I went to broadcast the program. I was going to put Tom Wilkes up, and I said, ooh, but this is known as the Sam Ho. Yeah. Anywho, yeah. Uh, when I saw no the one pic- knows why. No sorry. one knows why he chose Sam Hose. There was a Sam Hose, uh, but I don't know why he decided to be a member of the Hose clan. Uh, unless his mother had been, I didn't find that out. I don't know. And that, but so that's why I I chose it. Hmm. I did the same thing. Uh, what now? I told listeners I had never heard of Sam Hose until I stumbled into the library looking for the Zachariah Walker book, the lynching book. Yeah. Um, when I yeah. saw the pictures, I said, "Oh, I've seen this picture like eight billion times." Um, 
since there were so many black people lynched, why has this photograph you think? Because I told listeners, like, if you look and you see, you'll be, oh, anybody, if you've seen lynchings, you've seen this photograph. You've seen the lynching of Sam Hose. You just didn't know. Like, oh, that's Sam Ho- Tom Wilkes. You just didn't know. Why is this photograph so widely circulated, you think? Oh, um, this was not, <laughs> this is uh, the cover and the uh, picture is a function of editorial decisions. Um, I wanted a um, picture on the front of a, of a fire. And uh, I don't know where we got uh, the picture from, but we didn't get it from Sam Hose. Um, but I don't know, I forgot. I mean, at the time I knew, I just can't remember now uh, where we got it. So it was editorial decision, nothing, nothing more. Just, I mean, in general, like not just your book. I mean, it seems like this is one of the more widely, cert- like the image of Sam Ho's uh, lynching seems like it's one of the more widely circulated lynching photographs. Um, is that? Is- uh, yeah, I haven't seen that. I don't, I don't have a photograph of it. Oh, okay. I looked online. I, and- I, I, I I saw the Atlantic. I saw the Atlantic uh, Journal cartoons of it, mm-hmm. but um, gosh, I missed something. I missed it. I don't know. Okay, they have. Uh, unless I've been deceived, they have pictures uh, online. Maybe they're you know not. Uh, I can look it up. I <laughs> I'll look it up. Uh, any in any case, you have to wonder where where they got the pictures. Uh, they're probably line drawings rather than photographs. Um, it would have to have been fo- uh, line drawings because uh, the, the phot- photography and the newsprint were difficult at that time, and they relied mostly on on uh, uh, drawings of photographs that the artist was working from when they drew- put it into the paper. So it would have been representational rather than actual whatever it was i see i see i'll look at this again to see make sure there says that's so many black males like gee whiz uh before uh we let you in and i'll send you if i oh make yeah sure yeah, yeah there would be a lot of there would be a lot of photographs of of lynchings yeah there would be a lot of that whether it's sam hose i i uh and if it's accurate of Simon Hills, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I kind of doubt it. But uh, there are, I've seen a lot of, I mean, there's a book of postcards representing lynchings. Uh, and uh, so we know, I mean, people, white people were would send these damn cards uh, to their relatives, uh, indicating that they were participating in effect, in the lynching by representing it and sending it off, expanding the knowledge of of this atrocity uh, beyond the actual site where it took place. Uh, that's what, uh, so. But there is this this uh, without sanctuary. It's the name of the book, and it's a book of, of, of postcard lynchings. You've probably seen it, actually. I've actually been, they had an exhibit for that book at the King Center in Atlanta, yeah. no less. And I went to the yeah. exhibit there. It was a very powerful, powerful book. Uh, James imagine, Allen, yes. I believe, is the author. And seeing it at the King Center, no less, was would leave an impression for sure. Uh, being yeah. a very white man in his 90s who lives in North Carolina with the research that you do, we generally ask every white person this one. Uh, in your time on the planet, have you heard any racist jokes? And if yes, if you can remember any, could you share? Uh, this is one that we try to analyze, break them down. Uh, I'm always super grateful. Have you heard any racist jokes, Dr. Matthews? If you can recall one, can you share with us? Um, I must, I, I've heard them. I don't, I don't know what they were. I I turned away. I don't listen to them. I don't. 
I walk away. I don't. I don't deal with. Them. Uh, so I can't. And I would, quite frankly, if I could think of them, I wouldn't tell anyone. Because you'll think they're just. You don't. I don't want a talk like like that. I don't want to do that. But I don't know any. No, I don't. Know. Don't know any. I don't even know any sleight of hand things. What's that? Uh, what is a sleight of hand thing? A subordinate clause. <laughs> Mm-hmm. In a conversation, in other words, someone would say something. If you know what I mean about niggers, that's it. Oh, a I slide, see. Slide of hands. <laughs> there are all kinds of ways. <laughs> There's all kinds of ways of making point. I see. I see. See, I'm still learning. I, that's why. It's, that's why I ask. See, because I'm still learning, and I found that that <laughs> is a, a rich source of information. Just hearing. That's one of the few times. White people speak honestly about non-white people and black people Probably. specifically. Yeah. Like, oh, so I'm always grateful. I always, and we get that response pretty much like 95% of the time. White people, we even had white people on this program who like grew up in Louisiana, Alabama, places like that, where they've said, Hey, I've heard thou, like literally thousands, and I believe them, thousands of racist yeah. jokes. And they can't remember one to share with us like that is. Well, you know, I grew up in Idaho. Uh, my hometown was uh, 25% Hispanic. Um, uh, Mr. Ruiz, who taught Spanish, was my father's friend. Uh, I uh, I never heard anything about Anybody that they referred to them as Mexicans, my father didn't, but that, you know, they would come. Um, so I, and uh, <laughs> I was not, my father did not tell such jokes. He didn't tell jokes at all, as a matter of fact. Um, so I never heard joking as a means of communication about anything when I was a kid. And... I never heard any when I went to seminary, uh, and I may, uh, I might have heard some when I was in graduate school, uh, but I, I don't, I don't know if I did. I can't remember. Um, I did lose my temper a couple of times on uh, certain things having to do with other people, uh, but. Uh, I, I can't. I can't really remember any, any of these things. I don't. As I, I'm not a great joke teller anyway. It's so hard for me to remember them. I see. Did you lose your temper with someone non-white and say something racist yourself, or was it something else? It was something else. Oh, okay. Just making sure. So, they, uh, he committed suicide, and someone said, "Well, what do you expect from blank?" And I, I raced for him with, with my fist raised, and one of my friends stopped me. Two of my friends stopped me. I was furious. I was furious. I, I, mean, I, I don't usually lose my temper like that, you know, but that's the only time I can remember. I um, see. I'm just making sure I understood it correctly, so... Uh, it was a, uh, I guess a black person had committed suicide tragically, and this other person, I guess. No, I think it was a native, it was an East Indian. And, um, oh, okay. And so a non white person. Non white person. Non white, yeah. Committed suicide tragically, and then this other white yeah. person said, What do you expect? It, wh- wh- what what do you I guess, expect what did they say? What, did they, what do you expect of. Yeah, what do you, of such people, or, de- or Indians, or whatever, I don't know. Okay, but okay. dismissing a, a, a suicide like that? No, no, I, that, that, that was. Uh, I was surprised that that, that I was so uh, action oriented. Actually, I'm I'm not usually that way. Hmm. That's uh, steal a line from the book as we depart. Cats' lives matter, not black lives, or non-white lives in general. Yeah, you got that. Yes, uh, that was. 
that's one of those um <laughs> that's one of those episodes that is just so telling I mean, it's just so telling to be expected unfortunately uh in the system yeah. of white supremacy and we just talked about that too <laughs> in fact like a couple days ago uh but yeah that all everything flowing in the same direction anywho uh the book uh at the altar of lynching burning sam hose in the american south uh the author Dr. Donald G. Matthews uh, chatting it up with us. I'm pretty sure where he will be uh, tomorrow around this time. So good luck uh, to the team. Thanks for sharing a bit of your Sunday afternoon. Uh, was a hoot chatting about the book. Good, sir. All right. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, take care. All right. We'll do it. Bye. Dr. Donald G. Matthews, very white. He said, I should have asked that before. Uh, forgot, forgot. I should have asked that one before uh, he departed. What exactly does that mean? Very white. But I think we did get a demonstration as he was here. Uh, I will take a, a quick moment and then we'll see if folks have any thoughts uh, of what they heard from Dr. Matthews, uh, one thing that I do want to point out any time that we have non-white people where they rattle off lots and lots and lots of non-white people uh, as like experts on racism, white supremacy, like he uh, or he didn't say, I'm just saying that was why I uh, went to investigate the New York Times piece where he was talking about the lynching bill uh, by Jamel Bowie. That is a non-white male. Uh, he mentioned Dr. Ursula Orr, that is a non-white male. He said John Hope Franklin told him he had to put the incident about his own grandfather at the beginning of the book, uh, where all of these non-white people, he says in the book that it was black people who knew best uh, about the history of white people raping black people. Um, even the direct question, who's more confused about racism? Uh, and he said that white people are confused. White people don't really know how the world operates. That right there is so common. It is so illogical. Uh, if black people were the experts on racism, this problem would be solved. All of that. Anyone suggesting even that white people are not aware, even while he said, I think the incident with his grandfather is important too, but for the exact opposite reason. If you are white, you have to be an expert on racism, white supremacy, or exactly what happened to his grandfather could happen to you. Nigger lover, we will drag you out of the church in front of your family, beat you to death and leave you for dead. And then punish the rest of your family. <laughs> they were in poverty. Now you put that in quotes because lots of race soldiers like, you know, whine and say that, oh, I'm impoverished. I don't have two nickels rubbed together. I got to go and pretend to be a nigger to get reparations. You have lots of that. So, but I mean, hey, you cannot be ignorant about white supremacy, racism. Period. And I think he even agreed. He gave the affirmative. White people will let you know. What are you doing? And it's not even, oh man, look here, Brother Donald. Uh, uh, maybe you didn't get the meeting. No, it is, you should already know this. We don't give remedial courses to grown white people on white supremacy racism. You should already know this. consequences too we don't need to emulate that victims of racism sometimes I hear people we should do the same thing no uh, this is this is how a gang operates we are not trying to become a gang although it is very effective for what they are doing yes compliance yes anywho um not that any of these people, you know, victims guaranteed, qualified, Jamel Bowie and all that. Incidentally, I do think that that is very important. Jamel Bowie's piece. How do you write a whole lengthy report on lynching 
racism is not mentioned one time. White supremacy is not mentioned one time. Racial terror and all these uh, get pussyfooting. I said that already, right? Circumloquacious. Lots of ways of not really being direct and making it plain. And the question retired firefighter asked, hey, if we're going to be talking about lynching and it's not connected to white supremacy racism, ooh. So that means we could end up having non white people being victims and accused of lynchings? Just like with the hate crimes? Mm. don't be surprised about that either we will take a very uh, brief break and then we'll hear if folks have uh, questions insights uh, they would like to hear from Dr. Matthews who uh, in some not certainly not with the directness that's when you can he's about the same age as Neely Fuller Jr. thereabouts Mr. Fuller is like maybe two years older than he but pretty much at that point like you're all about the same age um yeah like you can you can even think about that because they would pretty much be drawing from the exact same knowledge and in fact the Oklahoma connection right that's where his grandfather got beaten to death almost Oklahoma Mr. Fuller born in Muskogee Oklahoma so I mean they should have lots of the same reference points and thoughts and all of that. Mr. Fuller talks about seeing Pearl Harbor as a child. It should be like lockstep uh, in terms of a lot of the things and events that they've seen and major influences on how they think about racism, white supremacy in the world in which we live. We'll take a moment, think about that, and when we'll be right back. Context of white supremacy. and throwing things from the door of an airplane. See, they like to be in an airplane. <laughs> okay, Galen, line number two. You are now on with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. What is your question? Uh, greetings. Uh, my question is, uh, Mr. Fuller, in his writing and many of his talks, uh, he consistently says and writes that uh, racism is white supremacy. White supremacy is racism, connecting those two concepts uh, however, many, many of the black people that I've heard who have read his material or who have listened to him through the years, they will still add that conjunction and say racism and white supremacy as though these are two separate concepts. And I want to know if uh, Mr. Fuller could explain or just give his thoughts on why so many victims of racism seem to have a difficult time. Uh, equating those two concepts and understanding why you emphasize that racism is white supremacy. Okay, good question, Mr. Fuller. Yes, that's true. Habit. In fact, I have had people interview me at great length repeatedly, and the person who was interviewing me would all, even though I am saying racism is white supremacy, white supremacy is racism. They are one and the same. the same. You don't separate those two terms. Never, ever separate those two terms. Racism, the only form of racism is white supremacy. And the only form of white supremacy is racism. They're one and the same. It's not white supremacy and racism, or white supremacy or racism. Never. But I've had interviewers, I mean, there are, there are records of many interviewers using the term white supremacy and racism racism and white supremacy even in the same interview where i'm saying don't ever separate the two they still separate <laughs> and they uh, out of habit yeah because that's that's you know our, our minds are kind of you know in a trance mm -hmm. but when it comes to understanding what racism really is see all it is is just understanding that racism is white supremacy white supremacy is racism yes and what is it what is racism what is racism good for Practicing, I mean, what is the being a member of a race good for? Practicing racism. Black people have been told we are members of a race. We're not members of any race. When did we join? 
We don't join races, you know. You say, well, I was born into a race. Yeah, because somebody told you that. And who was the somebody that told you that? The white supremacists. They did all the telling. Because they wanted they, to. They mm-hmm. invented this thing called mm-hmm. race. Race doesn't serve any purpose at all except to mistreat people based on color. That's what it is. All righty. And if I may add, thank you for your call. Context of white supremacy. ProduceJustice.com. NAB, Mr. Fuller's counter racist writings. The Cows listener supported Counter Racist Radio Invest. If you think the Cows is constructive, uh, offers any info that will help you understand what it means to be white, what white supremacy racism is, and how it works, visit the blog racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com. PayPal button top right corner. You'll see the links Venmo, Cash App, uh, PayPal. Hopefully worthy of your time and energy. Uh, that's it. I just really quick. He had one line. I didn't ask him about it. Just he said, <laughs> Dr. Matthews at the very beginning, he said, there's only one race, the human race. And I didn't, you know, make an issue because there was so many things I wanted to get to. Uh, the one race is the white race. Race is white supremacy, racism. There is no reason to belong to a race except to practice white supremacy. The one race, the very white race. Uh, so the one line I did not ask him, or there were several, but one that I thought was important. Uh, he writes, no mobs gathered in Newman, Georgia until April 23rd, 1899. In Coweta County, a white man might kill a black man in self-defense and avoid a trial. Blacks might try to kill a white man in case of a mistaken identity without igniting mob violence. That does happen in the book. Individual animosities and tension between tenants and landlords could be assumed as part of normal social relations, but the dramatic violence of the early post-war years was over. This was so even though citizens of the city and county knew that white vigilantes had tried to rid counties of the northwest of blacks. The people of Coweta County chose not to emulate such action. If they read the Constitution, a newspaper, they knew of violent incidents throughout Georgia and the South that attracted the editor's interest. They learned of the lynching of a white Yale graduate for rape or the beating to death of an old black woman and young boy for trivial crimes they had not committed. Noonan's citizens knew that the county's favorite son as governor wanted lynchers indicted, but white grand juries never agreed. When black children were reported to have hanged one of their playmates, all in fun, in quotes, No one seems to have thought much about what this revealed about white Southern culture. Noonan's informed citizenry knew lynching was always out there somewhere. Lynching seemed normal to black children. thought that was one of the most important lines of the book you can replace lynching with white supremacy racism absolutely that is refinement that is the entire goal of racist man racist woman racist child to make white supremacy racism seem normal default God ordained religion of white supremacy. That's where we started. Very important. And even especially if you are an attempted parent. I have to do everything in my power to make sure my child does not think. Matter of fact, even I have to do everything in my power to make sure that I don't think 
white supremacy racism is normal. White supremacy racism as a system dominates the known universe. This is not normal. Understanding we are in an abnormal environment. Unfortunately, it permeates the known universe. But this is very abnormal. All of this. Finding mummified nigra fingers in the attic is not normal. Having an entire section of the library that is exclusively about lynching negras, Sam hoses and the like, that is not normal. You have to beg as Mr. Fuller defines when you have to ask over and over and over when you have to beg for 150 years can you please stop lynching negras and chopping off their penises eh 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 <laughs> generations of white eh eh Haley's Comet has come around twice that only happens every 75 years eh That is not normal. And then Cat's Lives Matter, that's in his book. You have to wait 150 years for them to say, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. No more lynching. You got it, everybody. No, and, and racism, white supremacy, did we make this explicit? Or is this going to be one where, <laughs> no more lynching. You wait till we start. Oh, Renthal James lyncher just wait for that one I would hope to be incorrect we can come back in five years and say man oh man Gus T has been a coon a number of times that was one super wrong did have lots of logical reasons for why I would be suspicious but I was wrong would love to be able to do that in 2025 and hopefully I said five years to so 2027 and hopefully white supremacy racism all done replaced with justice we can do both of them then we shall see folks with commentary anything they would like to share from uh, Dr. Matthews uh, folks who dialed in with a hand up should be with us if you had a question uh, feel free if you did not have a question just had thoughts you wanted to share uh, from Dr. Matthews proceed uh, as I said Neely Fuller Jr. and Dr. Matthews are about the same age and even same background to Oklahoma geographic ties meaning just something to ponder as well any thoughts uh, thoughts observations from folks who are with us yes sir to suggest that white people are ignorant about racism is to welcome a third entity of power on why racism and white supremacy exist. And uh and that is not logical at all. Uh uh white people are good at uh persuading uh non white people to not to focus on them uh and to be illogical. Uh also uh uh, from the reason why I asked that question is because uh, that particular recent activity by white supremacists, and I'm talking about the office of the president, uh, uh, has been talked about re uh, recently, and the non-white people who were doing a uh, analysis of of that. Uh, state was stating that uh, it's very insignificant. You know, anything that has been going on for a century, and then finally somebody signed a white person signed something, it ought to bring up suspicion in the first place, because it doesn't take a whole amount of time to do things that are correct 
that's accurate unless you have some sort of uh, idea in mind that you don't, you do not want to be correct, but you want to deceive some other person that you are doing something correct. And uh, it's kind of like reminds me of uh, the term that's called read the fine, the fine, the fine print. You know, when it comes to something like buying a car or something like that that it may not be what you thought it was. Uh, and we definitely have to, to uh, practice that, uh, to really study and read things, especially things that white people come up with and present to us uh, because they have a long-standing habit of being the number one experts in deception. Uh and uh, those are some of the things that I was thinking about when I uh, was asking him uh, that question. Thank you. Number one, deceivers, master deceivers, master deceivers. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Any of the other folks who are with us have comments here that they wanted to make sure that they get in? Yeah, Gus, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, you know, so, you know, again, um, it gets kind of hard not to uh, follow up your questions sometimes with a comment or, you know, start start making speeches, you know, especially when you're, you know, talking to uh, my guests. But, uh, you brought up, but but actually, uh, thank you because you, you you ended my came right behind me and said exactly what I wanted to say uh, after the question. Um, you know, so you know, even when you just brought up the New York, I think it was New York Times uh, article, and um, I'm not sure if you know Gus T is, is a scholar or you know a historian, or a journalist, but you know, you take time out to count the numbers of times that racism is mentioned. So, or, or white supremacy. So, you know, when I asked him, was the media complicit? And he just basically um, said that, you know, not all journalists or not all people are in the, or in the media are, you know, responsible. And again, you know, they'll bring up Fox News. You know, Fox News is News Corp. You know, that, 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 that's a global media, you know, empire, you know, across the, you know, across the globe. That's, that's nothing small. And just like you pointed out, the article about lynching was, you know, racism was left out. Uh, white supremacy was left out. These people have editors. You know, these people have to, before, he, and he, he said these, these dumb people. So that's why, toward the end, I mean, well, am I to come to the conclusion that all, so these dumb people, the most powerfulest people in this country and on the planet? Because I've yet to see anybody challenge the narrative of CRT being harmful to white children. So all these dumb people clearly have the most power in the newsrooms. And, you know, so, and if, if he's in, you know, we use the term ally, if he is an ally and he's the best that we have to counter uh, racism, white supremacy, propaganda, and he just basically said, hey, you know, oh, well, you know, I do my best, you know, if, if you, you know, in other words, you know, if you, you know, if you like it, you like it, you don't, you don't, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a man, I'm fallible, so, hey, you know, that's the best you got. Unfortunately, as a white man, you can, you can, you can have that attitude that, you know, oh, well, you know, I wrote what I wrote, you know, if, if you agree with it, you agree with it. You don't, you don't. 
So, again, that's where the confusion comes in because other victims will listen to this man. And, again, I can't get into his head. I'm not saying that there's any um, ill intention in his writing. You know what I mean? Especially when it's dealing with information. The information is welcome. But you'll have victims be confused and just basically say, well, he's doing the best he can do. You know, he's doing the best he can do. And unfortunately, if these are the allies that we have that's coming from the white side of the chessboard, then we're never going to solve this problem. I close. Much obliged. I know it can be difficult wanting to respond. Uh, I just try to... Uh, make sure that we get to all of the folks who called in. That's why I try to make sure that we are efficient and minimize our speech of fine. Much obliged, sir, a victim in New Jersey. Uh, let's see. Confidant, I think you're on the vote. Uh, line. Greetings. Yes, yes. Yes. Mr. Renegade, uh, greetings, callers, listeners. Well, some of my observations, um, I was trying to look at some of the writing on this lynching of Tom Holes. And I was reading here where it says, um, Holes was brought to a patch of land and the mob used knives to sever Holes' ears, fingers, genitals, while others plunged knives repeatedly into his body. To cheers from the mob, men and boys, quote, boys, gathered killing from the nearby woods to create a fire. The skin from Hoses' face was removed and he was doused with kerosene. He was then chained to a pine tree. Several matches were thrown into the fire. Um, lighting it on fire and burning holes alive. And then my point is that, oh, one more thing. Ho screamed out, oh, my God, oh, Jesus. From the time of Ho's first injuries to his death, 30 minutes later, and one woman said that, oh, here's another point. His knuckles were being, his knuckles were being sold in a convenience store after this torturous crime. And so what I'm saying is that um, the guest, um, he said, as I think you mentioned to him that comparing somewhat of something of the Holocaust by Hitler I can't remember the context exactly, but comparing. And the guest said, oh, yeah, and we had our own, quote, little Holocaust. I mean, you know, little Holocaust? A black woman, he said, from Jamaica was his physician. And your point why did we need to know what her race was? Is this or was this his way of trying to give us the impression that he really didn't have any hatred or toward black people? My doctor, my physician, for God's sake, is white, is a, is a Jamaican, black woman. I don't think that was necessary for us to know that. Um, he said that uh, his grandfather or his great-grandfather drank 
a drink to Sitting Bull? Are you kidding me? Um, after Custer massacred the indigenous people, then his grandfather, you know, humanely drank a drink, drank a drink to Sitting Bull, please. And then he said he's frightened of what's going to happen with the racist, white supremacist terrorism that is going on uh, a la January 6th. He's frightened. Okay, and two more. He said that Mr. Hose's brother was mentally challenged. Why do we need to know that exactly? I Maybe someone in the group can answer that. And I don't understand why this was important information unless it was to continue to criticize and demean black people. Final observation. Um, he, oh, he started, he started tearing up. Well, he started tearing up. He said, what did he say? Uh, he, he couldn't understand the, the, the torture. I mean, Really? I, I don't want to make mockery, but, you know, please. And then the final observation. Um, this man said, you know, doc, the doctor, the good doctor said that he was or, a ordained minister, I believe, if I'm not, please correct me if I'm not, if I'm mistaken. And that there is always a part I know discussed where when you're interviewing or discussing important matters and it starts to irk the guest, they get microaggression starts to come out and they start to get angry. And he started cursing. He said he didn't give a, a shit, quote unquote, he didn't give a shit about the certain things that were being brought up. Just didn't give a shit about it. So those are some of my observations. Please correct me where I am in error. Thank you very much. That was an excellent interview, Mr. Renegade. The confidant, much obliged. Reading more important than watching television. It's so many of those uh, I don't know what you call it, passages of white terrorism and carnage in the book. I had the audacity to be like, oh, I already read that. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't read that. <laughs> I'm like, my fault. Yes, yes. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. It's so many. You could have just read all day. Like, yep. And carving black person knuckles. Yep. Genitals. Yep, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, great observations. I, uh, let me see. It was, oh, the doctor. Let me get that one first. Uh, him saying about he had a, and not just, uh, one of our homegrown Jamaican doctor that he went to. And I think that sort of thing is like, Hey, I got black friends. I have a Negro doctor. What do you mean up here trying to challenge me? I don't just write, look, look, most people wouldn't even let a Negro, you know, touch them. And so then, yes, yes, I went and, oh, you need to take, now that's one. Neely Fuller Jr. I have never, ever heard Neely Fuller Jr. <laughs> like, man, you know, talking about this racism stuff, like, woof, this is the worst thing ever. You got to just take a break sometimes. I have never heard him say that, like, at all. It's just been, hey, the problem, capital letters, the problem trying to devote as much time and energy as we can to solving this problem immediately as soon as possible but and, and I thought the same thing like I just said yesterday I was talking about white people and them giving the tearful performance for reparations he came in, I just said yesterday you can take the other Academy Award from Will Smith forget you know the smack and all that like <laughs> When these white people get out here and get the weeping and what have you to see if they can get them a California check for reparations. And he did the. Are you serious? I thought we were going to need to get him Kleenex. Like, come on now. Come on now. Come on. Come on. <laughs> like, uh, 
this happens all the time. And it was, you can, because the question, when I read one of the many, many, many passages that are like this in the book, and I asked him, can you speak to the homoeroticism of this? What's up with a bunch of, of white men having some sort of sexual bonding experience around carving up black genitals? And this is when the, this is not like everybody on the planet does this. This is white people exclusive. Then it's, oh yeah, I can't even, oh, it just, I'm just show shaking up. And you know, I got a black doctor, a Jamaican doctor, and she tells me you got to take a break from all this. And, uh, as for, let's see, the defensiveness, I thought that was really important as well. Uh, that I believe that was in the context of rape. Um, I said he was doing the same pattern uh, and saying, uh, whoops, egregious crossing of the color line. Or however, I don't have it, the, that page in front of me right now, but however you phrased it, I read it before, uh, as opposed to this is white men raping black males and females he doesn't talk about males but black females in the book uh, when I'm bringing this up and saying hey like call that out every time I mean, it's child rape frequently that this should be pointed out consistently uh, because this gets left out all the time that's why we're reading the book that we are that's when all the cursing and, I don't give a shit you don't like it and blah 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 <laughs> and then to come back later on and saying hey we should listen we shouldn't have it. Well, if that's the case, well, then you should listen to critique, right? Like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And especially if it's you niggers are the experts on this. That's what he said. You all know better. Oh, well, and let me listen to what you have to say. I'll listen to my Jamaican doctor. I'll listen to you too. Hear what you have to say. Like maybe this sex thing is a big deal. Maybe I should make sure that this is rape every time, not crossing of the color line like I said however it's phrased in the book it's, it's not child rape there's lots of all this sex and especially talking about black you know rapists that's you know all the way through the book he talked about that uh, and he points out Lundy Harris all this nonsense that's going on but I mean make that plain every time the power dynamics of it all of it make it plain and it shouldn't be any defensiveness about hey 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 I make mistakes, gonna make more of them. You got it returned. I don't give a shit. No, <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think the fellow before you, he said, man, if that's the best that we can expect from an ally, like, man, we are never gonna solve this problem. Yes, if we are relying on Dr. Matthews to say, and one thing I will say, I did appreciate when he gave the story about his grandfather. Now, I do believe there's some self serving interest in that that's enough that's you can put that next with the Jamaican doctor confused non-white people this is a good white man he's got black friends black doctor he hangs out with John Hope Franklin that's who told him to you know put that anecdote at the front of the book he did say hey it's not that my grandfather wasn't racist nigger jokes and all that or that I guess he didn't give a nigger joke he just called a black person a nigger about the same thing that I at least think is important because I think he could have went way more aggressive in trying to say yeah my granddad was John Brown and you know he wouldn't do it he was willing to die for the niggas and all that and he doesn't do that but I mean hmm. uh, great observations uh, the confidant uh, let's see were there other folks comments here they wanted to get in Uh, I have a I have another uh, thought. Hang on one second. Uh, retired firefighter. Was it anybody else that had commentary, or everybody was good? I did, but uh, he can go. All right. Well, we'll wrap up with being Santa Rosa. Well, I guess everybody else was good. We'll assume everybody else was good. Okay, then. So we'll get retired firefighter and then we'll wrap up with B in Santa Rosa. Yes. Uh, I, I, I am very forgetful. <laughs> uh, and uh, sometimes uh, my thoughts go blank. But uh, I think I think it would be also a good uh, 
continuous question when white guests come up, come on because uh, because of the fact that uh, the white guests that comes on the, that you have on the program are very skilled at many different skills and whatever that skill is uh, uh, the question should be well sir ma'am uh, with the skill that you have, and the willingness to uh, speak on or act on uh, racism or white supremacy, uh, what do you what do you think would be the solution? Uh, does it whatever you do, or, or put it put it in this fashion, whatever whatever you do, is it designed in the end to solve the problem of racism? If, of whatever you, that person is doing, whether they're historian or some sort of scientist or some sort, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that should be, or something similar to what, what I'm talking about, uh, should be asked to any, every one of these white guests that comes on the program. That makes sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because because otherwise what what's the what's the what's the use of you saying and doing what you're doing you, in other words it, to a white person they have to have another purpose if it's not that purpose because I was listening to the uh one of the callers uh ask the the white person about what suggestions that they had that that he has for non white people. And it is actually consistent on what the answer that he gave uh, uh, these white people. Well, I don't give, I don't basically say I don't give suggestions to, to uh, non-white people. <laughs> you know, it, it's consistent. As far as what I, I hear, uh, do you hear the, you hear the same thing? The consistency? Oh, absolutely. We have tons of that in the archives and just for listeners, you can just compare that with your life experience. That's one of the few times that I've seen where white people absolutely unwilling to, and I mean, not give a suggestion in normal circumstances. It's not a suggestion. They love bossing black people. It's like I boss niggers every day. I boss niggers in my sleep. That's what I do is boss niggers around and tell them what to do. That's the only time. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't tell black people what to do now, <laughs> but very consistent. And we got tons of those in the archives. They don't, they don't give us names. They don't give us names, names of who names of white people who practice racism on a daily basis that, that, that are past and present for us to know about, you know, nothing that would get them, you know, uh, uh, a, a visible, uh, quote unquote target from other white people. They don't, they don't say or do any, they, in other words, they're on code. They're on code. They practice on a white code. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, be in Santa Rosa. Hello. Yes, sir. Man, um, the entire firefighter hit everything on the head that I was actually going to say. Um, I, I felt like he was very uh, evasive. Um, and that's why I, uh, I asked the que- That's why I asked you to ask him a question about who's more confused. Because if you want to listen to, you know, the confused person on what to do about the situation, uh, it probably most likely won't even help. And um, I was, uh, and and that was pretty much it, you know. I just thought he was very evasive on on some things. A lot of things he kept saying he don't know. And I'm like, you're a historian. Given on the facts, uh, or given on based on what happened that you that you saw, what worked and what didn't work, what can you give us? But he was talking too much about a whole bunch of nothing, and he talked so much to the point where I almost forgot my question. And um, that's 
buckets of words. I had buckets of words queued up to play, but it was during when callers were asking questions, and I try not to play it. I try not to be disruptive. I think it's going to mess up when they're going to get their question in or whatever it is. Like I can have much better control uh, when I'm asking. That way I can just play it and then get to my next question. But I did have it there. If I could have got the timing correct. Um, incidentally, I think it was asked before, like, I'm not sure if Gus T, if you're a journalist or a scholar, victim of white supremacy, nigra. Words are important, though. That is something that I uh, do try to, because it's it just reveals so much. Even feverish. That was when I mentioned it, man. They have so many times where feverish is in this book from the 1800s where race soldiers are saying that black people are feverish. Let me see. I pull one from the book. Man, the late Pamela Evans Harris. I said her name. Uh, I said it a few times. Let me see how many times it's in here. And then maybe I'll give one of the uh, better illustrations I don't know if the confidant is here did you see that did you see how many times feverish is in this book I don't know if she's still with us or not she might have dipped out but no Mr. Renegade I didn't oh okay it's in here uh, a few times let me see I'll try and give you all one of the one of the better ones from the text let's see I'll give you I'll give the first one and then I'll see if I pull up. Okay. This is on page one or excuse me, page fifty seven. Sex, danger, and religion facing a savage fury. Uh the black chaplain who offended her had mentioned facts. Facts were clearer to southern white women than black men or New York editors. Facts would not, to be sure, mitigate the atrocious conduct of the Newman mob, she admitted, but they would explain its savage fury. Her facts were especially alarming as she portrayed a South engulfed in sexual danger so pervasive at no time. In no place is the white woman safe from the insults and assaults of the Negro brute. Harris announced that the South had for years been a smoldering volcano the dark of its quivering nights lighted here and there with the incendiary torch were pierced through the cry of some outraged woman daily life too was feverish with suppressed excitement and concealed animosities briefly she explained it is the fact of lambs and wolves in one sheepfold. Got biblical with the metaphors on us, right? There, but feverish. And like I said, now that's not the only time. That's just the first time where I saw it was like, oh man, <laughs> like you got to be joking. Now, I think of uh, the late Pamela Evans Harris uh, when I think of feverish. However, it was only compounded because <laughs> you want another one? Let me give you another one. Let's see. Uh, the Constitution's ed the Constitution is a newspaper in Georgia. The Constitution's editors thought vigilance was justified by a hostile Yankee instigated unrest that had been, they claimed, escalating for 11 months among the blacks. Editorials scolded African Americans if they were to be accepted as law-abiding citizens they would have to break the fitful fever of the past few years that fever fanaticists claimed had arisen from blacks craving equality the effrontery seemed to fill the air so that even the most innocent request could be taken as an unwarranted challenge and he I think he did talk to us about how the metaphor rape was a metaphor for wanting equality or anything so all of this is feverish that I said now this is from the 1800s as I said 
So just think about that. So you have white women 120, 140 years ago. Feverish black males, feverish black males, they're raping white women, feverish. What does that mean that you can fast forward 120 years and find multiple black females saying that black males are feverish? And it's multiple because it's not just Pamela Evans Harris, the late, beloved, the black macho right there as well feverish black males that I would submit is another one what does domination look like race soldiers can spit out their racist rhetoric anti-black and black misandry rhetoric in 130 years you will be using their rhetoric as though it's your own that's one in fact oh I know Pamela Evans Harris well I would love it to have done it privately to just show her this Pam what do you think did you know they got race soldiers from the 1800s accusing black males of being feverish about the exact same thing that you said the Pam I know would have been like wow Gus I'm so glad you shared that with me I'm still learning. She would have quoted Mr. Fuller. I'm still learning. And she, I, we, victims of white supremacy. But that's what domination looks like. You see, you want another one? I can give you another one if you want. <laughs> Go, let me give you one more. Feverish. Let's see. Oh, it's quite a few. <laughs> let's see let's see let's try and give you the the best one did does anybody here were you all with us you heard that uh about feverish black males uh in the book club or is that just me nobody here heard all that in black loves the revolutionary act feverish black males did anybody hear that maybe that was i didn't oh okay uh it's it's in pam's book black love is Okay, it's in Black Love is a Revolutionary Act, and uh, it is in uh, The Myth of the Black Macho. I forgot the black female author's name, uh, Michelle, whatever it is. I'll get in a sec, but um, yeah, it's <laughs> one of it, the Cow's Book Club 2018 when we read um, the Black Black Love is a Revolutionary Act, uh, where... <laughs> I just I started using it from there. Now why not? I even will say that sometime. I think someone just posted it on my Facebook page. Feverish blackmail. So this is on one point uh, one forty eight. Anyone reading news accounts of the hunt for Sam Hose would conclude that after ten days, determined men were frustrated and less cool than they had been. The sure fit of false leads, fanciful stories, and imminent captures seemed to stroke a fever heat that claimed ever more actors in a carnival of fury and fantasy and that even that even though it's not saying feverish black males the fever is about raping black males run amok and what are we going to do we got to get him and then burn him to death and chop off his penis and stick uh, bottle openers screwdrivers into his body into his eyes and what have you things in his rectum sell his knuckles for 25 cents hey he said it in the book what does it mean to be white the religion he called the religion of lynching the religion of white supremacy same thing anywho uh, one of our listeners even wrote a review of this book in 2018 she said she was going to recommend that we have Dr. Matthews on the program and whoop, whoop, then he appeared anyway no accidences no coincidences uh constructive media group dot pub uh it's listed an alt at the altar of lynching book title uh, i'll post it so you can check it out uh even one of the questions she asks she says you should keep in mind what does it mean to be white absolutely uh we'll be here at minimum on thursday for the book club mentioned already dear senator se may washington williams 
raping white men, not being called rapists. Much obliged for folks uh, tuning in way early. My God, I hate early programs. Ugh. Made it through. Hope it was worthy of people's time and energy. And we were like just got off the air 12 hours. That's another reason I hate early programs since we just ended uh, at 9 p.m. Pacific to then hop back on the air literally 14 hours later. Yeesh. Gus T needs a vacation, not Dr. Matthews, who was just watching Negras playing basketball last night, according to his own testimony. Anyway, uh, we'll be back at minimum on Thursday. Much obliged for folks listening in. Hope it was worthy of your time and energy. Uh, sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. We need fully functioning brain computers to solve this problem. Uh, if you're out and about, no confrontations with strangers. You should be thinking that they could be armed. You could be Sam Hose. Samantha Hose or you know, whatever. Uh, if you're in a vehicle, you're sober, buckled, not on the cell phone. We need all of our attention and we're trying to do the small things that we can to minimize contact with race soldiers badge or no all of that said creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person no name calling no gossiping let's be non-violent with other black people definitely not forgotten the late Pamela Evans Harris Cal signing up thanks all for tuning in <laughs>